open, and behold, a white horse, and he who was riding it is called Faithful and True, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and in his righteousness he judges and wages war on the rebellious people. His eyes are a flame of fire, and his head are many royal crowns, and he, <coughs> and he has a name inscribed on him which no one knows or understands except himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven dressed in fine linen, dazzling white, and clean followed him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, his sword, which, with which he may strike down the people, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of fierce wrath of God, the almighty in judgment of the rebellious world. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw a single angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He shouted to all the birds that fly mid heaven saying, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may feast on the flesh of kings, the flesh of the commanders, the flesh of powerful and mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all humanity, both free men and slaves, both small and, and great, in a complete conquest of evil. Then I saw the beast and the kings and political leaders of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who is mounted on the white horse and against his army. And the beast, Antichrist, was seized and overpowered, and with him the false prophet, who in his presence had performed amazing signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were hurled alive into the lake of fire, which blazes with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds fed, fed ravenously and gorged themselves with their flesh. The Antichrist and the beast, they were destroyed marvelously. That's why we pray to God to deliver us from every evil, wicked thing that's down in our souls. Because we don't want to be deceived and we don't want to go to hell with him. Because he's going to be thrown into that lake of fire. And Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you, Father. We ask that you forgive us from any and all sins, Lord God. Anything we could have ever done or said, Lord God, or acted towards anybody in the wrong way, Lord God. Father, we ask that you forgive us, Lord God, from unforgiveness, Father God. Show us where it is, Lord. We don't want any little foxes, Lord God, down in our souls, spoiling the vine, Lord God. Father, so that's why we come before you, Father God, to destroy anything in us, Lord God. Anything, Lord God, that acts upon you, Lord God, or acts unseemly, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you right now, Lord God, for the vestige of righteousness, Lord, being bestowed upon us, Lord God. Wearing a white robe, Lord God, fine linen, Lord God, dazzling white, Lord God, as bright as the noonday sun, Father God, that we'll be able to enter into your presence, Lord God, in purity and holiness and righteousness, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that we can call on you right now, Lord God, knowing who you are, Lord, knowing what you come to do, Father God, to set the captive soul free, that we may be delivered so we can deliver others. And Father, we thank you for it right now. Have your way in this place this day. Break off every shackle of dominance in our minds, Lord God, that want to keep us captivated, Lord God, with the ways of the world, Father. Break them down right now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, where we have allegiances and alliances with people we should not have, show them to us today, Lord God, so we can renounce them and break covenant, Father. Because we want to be like you, Lord God, who you are, and that's free. Lord God, we thank you for bringing deliverance to us, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord God. Without it, Lord God, if this would be an arduous journey, Lord God, a hard journey. But Lord God, you bring forth, you brought forth freedom so we can make it, Lord God. You loose the Holy Ghost on us, Lord God, as a free gift. So he will show us, Lord God, who you are, Lord God, and show us why we need you, Lord God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place, in our lives every day, every day, Lord. And we thank you for it right now, Lord, because we know without you, we couldn't make it, Lord God. We couldn't do one thing, Lord God, without you, 
Lord. So, Lord God, we thank you, Father God, for coming here today. We thank you, Lord God, that we'll be able to rejoice in you, Lord God, with the spirit of freedom, Lord God, and liberation, Lord, to sing praises unto your holy name. For this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Father. And we thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. And let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have your way, Lord, in this place. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord our God, the omnipotent reigning. I thank the Lord for liberty and freedom every day. That we don't have to be bound, Lord God, to the ways of the world. And that he's come to set the captive soul free. Amen. 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 Let's praise him this morning. We got a reason to. Lord Jesus, have your way, Lord God. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Break us open, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And pour us out to the nations, Lord. Do what you want to do, Lord God, with these vessels that's yielded to you this morning. Do whatever you want to do, Lord. Holding nothing back from you, Jesus. You pick us up, Lord God. And you use us, Lord God, according to your perfect will, Lord Jesus. According to your will, let it be done, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We lift our voices to you, O Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord, Jesus. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for coming to see about us this morning, Lord. We thank you for being our Father. We thank you, Lord God, for showing yourself strong this morning, Lord Jesus. Continue the work that you've started today, Lord. Everybody, Lord God, in here that's going through a deliverance, Lord Jesus, continue it. Don't take your hand off, Lord God, until the work is complete, Lord. Do what you want to do, Lord God, because we yield it to you, Father. And we worship you, Lord God, because truly you're worthy, Lord. We need you, Lord God. We need one another, Lord God. And we won't stop telling one another, Lord God, that we need each other, Lord God, because we are the body of Christ, Lord. We are, Lord Jesus, and we praise you for it. We thank you, Lord God, for choosing us for such a time. As this, Jesus. You did it, Lord God. You called each of us by name, Lord. And you make no mistakes, Lord God. I wasn't a mistake, Lord God, and none of these were a mistake, Lord. And I just praise you for it this morning, Lord God. We lift our hands to you, Lord God. We honor you with everything we have, Lord God. And we just worship you, Lord God. In Jesus' holy and mighty name, we thank you for this, Lord. Amen. All right, how's everybody doing this morning? All right, we're going to get rolling here. Before we get going, always, as always, by way of announcements, we try to get these announcements done to keep you abreast of what's going on around here. <clears throat> and um, we always start off with books to, for you to read to enhance your spiritual growth. Of course, the first book we've been talking about for the cu- last couple of weeks has been Discerning and Defeating the Ahab Spirit. Discerning and Defeating the Ahab Spirit. You know, there are two predominant spirits that dominate the society we live in. And of course, that's Ahab and Jezebel operating in unison. Ahab, the disempowered man, and Jezebel, the dominatrix that dominates the disempowered man. Unify those two spirits together, and you get the present-day situation that we face on a global scale. So we got to defeat that Ahab spirit in order to disempower the Jezebel spirit. You got to get rid of that emaciated, effeminized, weak man as the one that's uh, abdicating his authority to the Jezebel spirit 
allowing the devil to rule. So this is about discerning and defeating the Ahab spirit, the key to breaking free from Jezebel. So this is by Steve Sampson, S-A-M-P-S-O-N, Steve Sampson, available on Amazon.com, discerning and defeating the, Je the Ahab spirit. It'll help you be able to see this thing and overcome it. You don't want to be a woman joined to an uh, Ahab spirit because that'll be the worst mess of your life. Because that thing there is not capable of loving a woman. It's not capable of, of being a leader and somebody that can actually have authoritative uh, guidance given to a woman. It's not authoritative control. It's guidance. It's leadership. It's insight and foresight presided by God in order for that man to be able to see what to do and how to do it and what to say and how to say it. So you don't want to be yoked to somebody blinded by the devil, caught up in this world with the Ahab spirit. That would be the worst mess of your life. Discerning and defeating the Ahab spirit. Be able to see that thing to avoid years of turmoil, conflict, and just total agony trying to deal with that spirit. Get a copy of this book, Amazon.com. The other book is The Organic Gospel, written by myself and Maisha Hunter. The Organic Gospel details factually how the gospel is organic. It's alive. Once the gospel is mixed with the Holy Spirit of God and embedded in the human soul, it takes on an organic life that begins to grow and permeate every fabric of your being. If you allow it to expand, it will actually change you into the image that God wanted you to be in when you were first born. And uh, you, if you had not been uh, appended to sin and, and, and dealing with sin. So he's trying to renew us and refresh us back to what we should have been before Adam and Eve fell. So he wants to restore us. He wants to restore our souls to normal. And God's way of doing it is through organic displacement and change. He changes one life into another life. He exchanges a life for a life on the cross. He gives you, <laughs> you a new life at the expense of the old life at the cross. So once that new life is embedded in you in seed form, it has to gestate, grow, and consume you. And that new life will bear fruit, the nine fruit found in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith are the manifestations of that new life. Once those fruit are shown through you, it means the life has come to maturity and it's manifesting out of you a nature change. You got to understand how it works. The Organic Gospel, you can get a copy of this book at www.theorganicgospel.net. www.theorganicgospel.net. It'll help you grow in your spiritual life and have you to understand what you're dealing with on a daily basis. Also, at that same website, theorganicgospel.net, you'll find a link to join a class that we teach every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time that teaches the organic gospel book. So go to that website, www.theorganicgospel.net, click on that link that will have you walk through the registration process for the class for the organic gospel, and also be made aware that there's a link there for a study guide. You can click on that link and pull down the study guide for the organic gospel. So we're trying to make it user friendly for those that really want to know what you've gotten into when you're born again, making a avenue of edu education available to you to understand the, uh, the uh, salvation process. Theorganicgospel.net, all of these resources are there. Avail yourself of them so you can have an aid that's going to help you in your spiritual life. Next thing, remember the prayer line every night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every night is the prayer line. Join us on, in, on the intercessory prayer line. We pray about deliverance. We pray about life in general. We pray about people being saved. We pray about everything. The Bible says men ought always to pray and not faint, never give up. So we pray every night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join in on that prayer line. That number is 770 712-5603, 770-712-5603 for the prayer line, and the access code is 409-367, 409-367 pound. So join us on the prayer line, that's every night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except for Wednesday night, when it changes over to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
in order to accommodate Bible study that takes place from 7.30 to 9 on Wednesday night. So join us on the prayer line. The prayer line, again, is another resource to help you grow in grace. Next thing, remember, doing the tabernacle supported. The vision remains the same, a base camp for people to come out of once they've been uh, made over into a new creation in Christ, a place to operate from in order to lead others to Christ. We're evangelistic. We got to keep moving to save people, to harvest souls, to see that these folks come to know Jesus Christ just like we did. So we need a place to operate from to get that done. We're tools and all types of type of teachings and all type of type of ministry is available to help people as they're getting saved. It's not good to evangelize people out there on the street and they don't have anywhere to anchor themselves. They need an anchor. They need to come in as babes and babes need a foundational family unit to operate in in order to grow. You can't save somebody and throw them to the wolves. They got to come and get settled and go through these transformation processes. And, uh, you know, this process is that letting that old nature die and have that old nature replaced by a new nature. It takes time. You're not uh, able to do this overnight. You know, just like Rome, Rome was not built in a day. So a human being cannot be built in a day. You ha they have to go through processes. And I'm uh, assured and I'm, I'm very uh, aware of the fact that people have to have a system to operate in. People are sy systematic. They have to have systems. Systemic teaching, systemic leading, systemic programs in place so that they can grow and be nurtured. People operate in systems. Your body is a system. You have different systems in your body that makes your body function right. Everybody needs a system. If you're not in a system, you won't have any kind of a parameter, any guidance to know where you are and where you're going and how you're growing. So you got to have a system in place for people to actually structurally understand what they're doing and be able to actually evaluate and monitor their progression. School is a system. And you can go from grade level to grade level after being tested at a grade level to make sure you are ready for that next graduated step. You got to have a system to take a check on yourself to know where you are at any given time. So you won't take on more than you're able to do because you're not mature enough to handle it. Systems provide double checks. That's what Dunamis Tabernacle is. It's a system for growth. That's why Jesus left here. And he sent back apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to establish a system for maturity, he says in Ephesians chapter 4. He says those five ministry gifts are given to perfect the saints, mature the saints, so that as they go through the maturation processes, they're able to do the work of the ministry. That's, that's system talk. He established a system, a program. He established a, a, a functional structured environment that's all contingent upon the right environment and the right atmosphere for growth. A greenhouse is designed to grow organis organisms in it. You know, if you got plants and you got vegetables and you got things you want to grow, a greenhouse is to establish to establish the environment, the right temperature, the right humidity, the right amount of sunlight, to actually make growth of whatever you're trying to grow, you know, accommodate it. That's what you got to have in, a, in, a, um, in a, any kind of a structure that God ordains for growth of his people. You got to have the right greenhouse, the right atmosphere, the right environment for you to grow in. You grow in a right place and you got to be rooted and grounded and planted somewhere. You'll never see a tree growing when it's been pulled out of the ground. It's got to be planted, rooted, and grounded. And then it can grow. Folks are out here as wildfire trying to grow in Christ. And they always go off because they're not rooted and grounded anywhere. We live in a structured society now. If you know the society, nobody has any functional root in them. They run around with no parameters for guidance. Nobody instructing them. Everybody does what they want to do. And everybody's here to full shipwreck. Because they got no foundation. Why? The family unit has been attacked. And when you attack the family unit, the structure is destroyed. And now folk just run around like a ship without a rudder. No, they just adrift at sea. Whatever the wind blows and however the current goes, 
they flow with it because they don't have a structure that brought them up to be rooted and grounded in belief systems. Without a root in you, without an anchor in you, any wind of doctrine that blows through, you're privy to it and you fall prey to it. So you see how you got to be rooted in sound doctrine so that when something new comes along, and it always does, it's really not new. Doctrine cycles through over and over again. Doctrine is cyclical. It just cycles through, cycles through over and over again. And you'll see the same thing coming through again. But if you've been around long enough, you'll know ah, that's that same junk again that came through in the 80s. Here it is rebirthing itself again. And you'll know. But if you're young and don't know anything about this, something that's new to you is old hat to an old head that's been around. So that's why you got to have eldership and people that can see because they know the way they've seen it before. But to a person just coming into this, everything is new. Your newborn child will put their hand in a socket, put, put a straight pin in a socket because they don't know anything about a socket. But your, your knowledge about electricity in that socket is going to stop them from killing themselves. So that's why people need proper guidance. And that's what we want to do with Dunamis Tabernacle, provide eldership, guidance, and an atmosphere and an environment for people to grow and stay stable in the middle of the road and stay sane. Sin is a result of insanity. I call it the insanity of sin. God offers you eternal life, peace inside, a clear mind, emotions that have been healed up, no more rejection, no more pride, no more uh, poverty. Every negative, God's salvation is designed to eliminate it. So you have to be a little bit twisted in your thinking not to accept the perfect deal and to opt for the devil is full of hatred, fear, anxiety, depression. Every negative thing you can attribute to a human, the devil is the person that, that doles it out. So I'm trading in total peace, sanity, and finally eternal life in heaven for poverty, hatred, rejection, fear, depression, and eternity in hell. It's got to be something wrong with me. If I can't take the best offer ever made to a human being in this life and I opt for total depravity in hell instead, I got to check me. It's something, it's something wrong with me. It's like somebody saying, listen, you got two choices. Here's a beautiful home, totally stocked with food for the next 30 years. You don't have to buy anything. We'll just bring the food in. Everything provided. We got maid service that would do all the housekeeping, change all the sheets, clean all the bathrooms, no housework. The lawns will be kept. We got a lawn service going to take care of the house for you. Stop with food. Here's $80 million, too, in your account just to just live off of for the rest of your life. Two new cars and five vacations a year. Or you can live in this little shack with nothing and we'll bring by some bread and water every two days and leave it out front. And then you got to live off of that for the next six months. Now, that's your choice. It's which one would you prefer? Well, I, I just want to be humble. I just take the little shack. Not me. Not me. <laughs> See, you're, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. The devil's offering you crumbs from the table and kicking your teeth in, spitting in your face, treating you like a dog every day. And God is saying, come on up to the high places and live as a king and a priest. And you take the lowly, dejected, rejected arena of the devil as opposed to God's offer of the high life. I got to check me. I got to find out what's wrong with me. The devil has nothing. He's a rejected, ostracized, kicked to the curb being. And all he can offer you is his inner makeup, which is full of rejection, fear, hatred, negativity and turmoil that's all he can bring to the table that's all he's got but folk opt for that thinking i don't want god telling me what to do and i don't want to be in his kingdom i'm just gonna i'll just tough it out with the devil if you really check people i, I dare you to do this if you go and check what an unsaved person really believes and just don't say anything just say would you please tell me what you believe and just sit and listen for 15 minutes you're going to find out they're crazy. Just listen to them. Well, I believe that uh, we pray to our ancestors and, you know, in Egypt, you know, through Egyptology, you know that the sun god Ra is really God. 
and I worship Osiris and Isis. And I've come to the conclusion that really uh, Jesus is not really his name. He's really named Horus. And I've seen that uh, through studying my history and my black history that we are the Hebrews. And as the Hebrews, we then listen, within 50 minutes, you'll finally conclude. I don't think this elevator goes all the way to the top and they might be a couple of pints short of a gallon. And folks are ingesting this madness all day long, yelling out George Floyd's name in order to get the spirit of George Floyd to come upon them so they can identify with the death of George Floyd. As lesbians leading the Black Lives Matter movement tell you that you need to buy into their situation as they buy mansions all over the country with your Black Lives Matter donation. I say that and they get mad at me. I didn't get hoodwinked. Malcolm X told you you've been bamboozled and hoodwinked. He had enough sense to see that. He knew that integration was nothing but hoodwinking folk. It was destroying the black communities and he could see it. He said, man, we've been hoodwinked. I think we've been integrated into a burning house is what he said. And folk just running behind these nuts, letting the nuts lead them. And they're crazy. And you follow abject insanity right into hell. When God's word is right there as a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. All you got to do is read the Bible. It'll tell you everything that's going to happen, everything that happened, and everything that's futuristic. He can tell you the past, present, and future in the word of God. And you can see what's going on. I don't know what's happened to people. But folks have opted to follow insanity. And I'm going to highlight today all the insanity people are following and where it leads today. We talk about the message of the day being bundled to be burned. God is actually consolidating all the sinners to, in order to burn them all together. So he's bundling them together in order to burn them all as a pile together. So I'm going to show you how that works today. But hey, you can get out of all of that. Just do the right thing. Do the most tap on Agla's design for that atmosphere to be put before you and, and you being around an atmosphere that you grow in grace and know God for real and get out of here and find peace outside of this planet that is totally confused and full of just poverty and total anarchy. You want to get out of this fast. Do the most tap on Agla's support at www.omegaministries.org www.omegaministries.org or you can use our cash app uh, contribution uh, link it's, it's uh, dollar sign soldiers 345 dollar sign soldiers 345 is the cash app link or mail contributions to post office box 960146 Riverdale Georgia 30296 post office box 960146 Riverdale Georgia 30296 sooner or later God's going to shift it and it's going to go on the offensive we kind of wait circling in the atmosphere until God begins to move you know the Normandy does come after a while the Normandy invasion finally came Hitler had a lot of progression Hitler was many was taken over all of Europe conquered Eastern Europe then he began to go west Came into France, you know, Hitler took France. He invaded France and took France. Now he got to the seaboard there across the English Channel. He was coming across the English Channel and it's going to jump the English Channel. He had began the Blitzkrieg, which was bombing England consistently. He was softening the forces in England in order to invade England. So Hitler was bombing England to, you know, saturation bomb them first so he could come across the English Channel and invade Britain. And then come off the coast of Britain and head across the Atlantic to the eastern shore of the United States. The plan was for the Japanese invaders to come on the west coast. And he was going to cross the Atlantic and basically get the United States in a vice grip, crush the United States and rule the world. You know what happened at Pearl Harbor? They invaded Pearl Harbor, bombed Pearl Harbor, not knowing that they had almost destroyed the whole United States Navy. But they thought the United States Navy was so powerful and the armaments of the United States were so powerful that they hadn't done enough damage to invade. They should have kept coming. If they had kept coming, you'd be speaking 
Japanese right now. But the, for fear of this military might that was basically destroyed at Pearl Harbor, they retreated back to Japan, giving the United States time to switch all of the industrial complex over to a war machine. And they start turning out tanks and planes. All the factories in the United States shifted from production of, you know, stuff that we used in industry and, and you know, tractors and stuff like that. They turned and flipped all those uh, huge uh, plants over to war production, producing guns, ammo. You ever seen the um, pictures of women like Rosie the Riveter? Rosa the Riveter was the women that riveted the ships. They had the women, the women were called into the industrial complex and they became the workforce as the men went off to war. See, the women drove the workforce in America and they were riveting ships and building tanks and building planes and build. I mean, that thing was a wonder to behold. But that's what happens in a wartime setting. Everybody's mind shifts to like, we got to fight a war now. And therein lies the problem with the church. The church has been fed a placebo, so we're all pacifists, and nobody's in a wartime footing. So God has to call up an, a legion of warriors that are now on the, on the ground with a warrior's mind as opposed to being a pacifist. We got to shift the folks over to war and not just sitting around blowing bubbles and singing songs. You got to conduct the warfare, and we war against the demons. So that's what Dunamis Tabernacle is all about. It's for boots on the ground, conducting a warfare against the devil to set the captive souls free. It takes a war to save a soul. You'll never save a soul as a pacifist because whenever you walk up to somebody needing salvation, you're going to engage the enemies that hold them captive. See, they're held captive by demons. So you got to be able to engage those demons and drive them off for the person to even get clarity of mind to even understand what you just said. Because there's a cobweb of demonic intrusions into the mind that are thinking through them as them. So their whole view of life is skewed and perverted by the demons that live in them. And so when folk get mad at me, it don't bother me because I know it's the demons in them getting mad. Or fearful or whatever they want to do in order to defend that person from getting free. It doesn't matter what they say or do. I don't focus on them. We drive them out and off. So the person can come to a clarity of mind long enough to make an informed decision to choose Jesus Christ as a savior. But with all those demon, demons and demonic elements intruding into your thinking, it'll be talking to you as I'm talking. So we got to bind them and make them shut up so you can hear what's being said to you. When your mind is running 20,000 miles an hour, you can't hear because you're thinking too much. That's the voices of the demons. Those are the feelings of the demons permeating you. They'll make you feel something about somebody that's not even there because they're trying to keep you away from that person so they can keep you bound. It's all a warfare. You got to change your thinking processes to understand you war against the demons and the fallen angels and their master Satan that is astutely designed to program through mental projections and all kinds of psychological warfare to keep a human being chained and fettered and bound in a dungeon while walking around believing they're free. That's what Dunamis Tabernacle has to do that. It has to be a base camp for those kinds of people that are assigned to set other people free at the expense of yourself. It's got to be a self-denied life in a warfare. So when the United States turned on that war machine, everybody became selfless. All the effort in this country went to the war in defeating Hitler. So you know what happened? Once we got the steam built up and once we recovered from that Pearl Harbor attack, we marshaled the forces and we committed to war. And then they gathered the troops in Britain to go across the English Channel and confront Hitler and stop him at the Normandy invasion. You notice all the beaches that they invaded, they gave them the name of a state or a city in the United States, Omaha Beach and those kinds of places. Because we were coming in, and that was going to be it. We're talking about four to five million troops and ships and all the armament necessary to drive Hitler back out of France 
And we actually drove them back from France back into Germany. You know, in Europe now, countries are aligned that you can go from country to country on one train. You can take a train from Germany to France. So you drove them back from the borders of France into Germany and marched into Berlin to get him. And they claim he killed himself in a bunker there. But nobody really knows because nobody ever found his body. He might have been. Some folk claim he went to South America and got away and he lived down there the rest of his life. You know, like happily ever after, like a fairy tale. But when the war machine turns on, the environment changes. And we're going we're gonna to see how many Christians are really ready for a spiritual war as opposed to going to church and singing songs and playing, playing happy-go-lucky all day. Because it's going to change up. And the atmospheric change is going to finally indicate what we have as a church body globally. Because the ones that are not for real are going to step back because they're not going to be outfitted for war. But those that have made their minds up to do this thing are going to step up as a volunteer army. And that's where the wheat and the tares part company. The wheat are outfitted for war. The tares are cowards and they go home. So we're going to find out in just a minute just what we've got. But if you can see it, support the war effort. Support Dunamis Tabernacle www.omegaministry.org click on su support then donate or cash app again dollar sign soldiers 345 and the mail in location is post office box 960146 Riverdale Georgia 30296 last thing remember the conference is coming now 120 people just about registered right at headed toward 120 last I checked and it's a month out so you can see where it's going. You know, we hadn't gotten into the, the hardcore registration yet. Some people right here in Atlanta, they hadn't registered yet, but they got their hotel reservation made. They got their airline book or they got their pl travel plans made. Then the last thing people do is register. But you need to register now because we got to take a food count. So now it's June 27th today, right? Man, time. So you're talking about in two days, we're we'll, we'll exactly one month out from the time the conference starts. So you got four weeks, basically, which is plenty of time to register. And we, we usually see in these last four weeks, the last flood in. We're sitting on almost 120 now. So there's no telling what you're looking at as an uh, end number there. I know it's, I've talked to, you know, a couple of dozen people that's still registering right now. Family members still got to register. Folks saying they're coming, already booked their flights and still got to register from out of town. So we don't know what we're looking at, but that last little tidal wave is going to roll in over the next four weeks. So it's time to go ahead and do it right now. Get your registration done. You can make your reservation down at Hamlet Beach. If not, something that's close to Hamlet Beach because all of the events take place at Hamlet Beach Resort. But it's a lot of different areas around there to stay. You know, I think it's still some one bedroom villas left or whatever. Maybe because they have cancellations ebbing and flowing. You know what I mean? So you got to check with them to see what they got available. But come on down to the Soldier of Light. That's going to be July 29th through August 1st down at the Hammock Beach Resort in Palm Coast, Florida, 28 miles north of Daytona Beach, Florida. So you got a lot of recreational things to do around there, even going down to Daytona Beach for a day and hanging around and going to the pier down there and fooling around with your kids. There's a lot of stuff to do. But mixed into that is conference time, which will be Thursday evening, Friday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and then time allotted for recreation and some fun on the beach and hanging around and enjoying some of the amenities down there at Hamlet Beach Resort. So come on down. It's a good time, man. It's a lot of fun. A lot of folks come in early and stay late. Like you tried to do at the house party years ago and, and the dad that threw you, but out there saying you got to go home. I don't know where you're going, but you got to leave here. But a lot of folks come in like Tuesday or Wednesday and stay to the next Tuesday and Wednesday for a week, which is a good thing to do. You know, you come in like Tuesday or Wednesday, come through the conference Thursday through Sunday, then you spend time there Monday through Wednesday just goofing off on the beach and relaxing. I hate to leave the conference, conference immediately after it because, you know, you've just been through all of that. And that's a good time to rest for a couple of days and just relax and just, you know, blow off steam on the beach. Some people come down there like Deaknum did last year. You're going to leave and uh, I guess we, well, we just did another day, uh, you know, just because you'd be down. You'd be down at the beach, man. It's hard to come back to the, the rigors of everyday life when you're down at the beach. 
Remember baptism Saturday evening down there, Saturday afternoon would be baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. That's an experience in and of itself. You can say after you got saved, you got baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. That's not many people can say that. So uh, we baptize people on Saturday afternoon. If you need to be baptized, come on down, enjoy it. Souls of Light Conference. Registration open now at omegaministry.org. Click on that red and gold button on the home page. Go through the registration process, which will lead you into the reservation process. It's a lot of fun, y'all. We do it every year, and um, we look forward to seeing y'all down there this year. So that's going to wrap it up for the announcements. We're going to take up a quick offering here by way of the Internet. If you're giving online, just go over to omegaministry.org. Click on support, then donate. Do the best you can, and then come back to this message today, which is bundled to, to be burned. Bundled to be burned to see what God is talking about as he proclaims the future in the present. God's telling you what's going to happen in order for you to prepare for what's coming so you can avoid any negativity. God is a positive God. He does good things until you make him mad. But when you make him mad, you're going to see the other side of God. And believe me, you don't want to see the other side of God. Like they used to say on, you know, uh, the, the Incredible Hulk show back in the day. The man said, you don't want to see me angry. You don't, you wouldn't like to see it because I'll be turned to this green monster when I'm angry. Now, you want to keep me calm and peaceful because you wouldn't like me when I get angry. That's how God is. God is good. God is nice. God is sublime and peaceful until you make him angry. Then his character changes. And you don't want to be privy to that character change. We want to avoid that at all costs. So let's take a quick offering. We appreciate, we appreciate you giving. Be right back at you in about five minutes. All right. Let's see what we got here. Uh oh. The big boy is talking. All right, let's take a look at that. We're talking about bundled to be burned today. Let's understand this thing as it unfolds before our very eyes. You know, it's amazing how the Bible is unfolding before our very eyes right now. We're watching it in real time come to life. And you got a lot of people down here not even recognizing what's going on. As God is beginning to do a strange work, even as we speak, he's doing it. So let's take a... A minute to look at it so we can get some insight and foresight so we won't fall prey to what's going to happen and mix the boat. So let's pray and we'll get going here. Father God, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. God, open our eyes to be able to see what's going on. We don't want to be caught up in a disaster. We don't want to be the ones to fall prey to the devil's insidious plan to destroy people we want to be free enough to understand the times and the seasons and to move it's time to move we got to do something now we can't stay in the same place we've got to move so god give us the wherewithal give us the intestinal fortitude give us the courage give us the ability to hear your voice and respond to it as these things begin to unfold we don't want to be on the outside looking in god a lot of us in our, our whole lives, we were on the outside looking in, always just short, always just missing it, always just almost making it and never getting things done. But God, this time we can't afford to fall short. We got to be in line, in sync, in step with your plan, not to be led astray. So God, whatever you do, like the thief on the cross said, look, when you enter into your kingdom, just remember me. Remember me as these things unfold. Don't forget my name and don't forget that I'm with you and I'm in it and I mean business. I'm not here to be left behind and just pining away, wishing I had a wishing I could have, wishing I should have and miss everything. So, God, you let your grace take hold on every heart here and every heart listening to this message in the future that they can see the times of the seasons and the necessity for change. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're talking about bundle to be burned. Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to begin to read at verse 24. Matthew 13. Beginning to read at verse 24. We're talking about bundled to be burned. 
bundled to be burned. If you listen to my way of the internet, get your notepad out, take notes. Don't ever let anybody teach you the Bible and you don't study yourself and double check what they're telling you. I don't care if it's me, your cousin that's got a church, or whoever's trying to teach you the Bible, always take your own notes, go back and double check and triple check everything taught to you so that you're not deceived. Don't run around listening to all these messages on the internet and YouTube and not double checking what's told to you. You've got to know because this is your eternal life, your eternal destiny is in play. And you can't afford to be deceived. You can't afford to listen to everybody and think everybody's telling you the truth. If they don't speak in accordance with this Bible, disregard them. The Bible says if you speak not according to the law and the prophets, let you be accursed. You got to stay with the Bible to be telling the truth. Everything else is subject to a person's interpretation and somebody's feelings about it. You got to have the Bible reveal itself to you. And only God can do that as you give yourself over to him, trusting him and believing in him to tell you the truth that is designed to make you free. So we're looking at Matthew 13, verse 24. Let's begin to read. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sows good seed in his, in his field. Now you see now, again, here we have organic language. It's always organic language in the Bible. Sown seed in a field is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's always talking about organic life that's going to be planted and allowed to grow. It's going to flourish and grow in the right environment and under the right circumstances. This is why the devil always tries to distract you away from what you need to grow the word. Did you not know everybody not saved is sent by the devil to try to choke off the word? And what does the Bible say chokes off the word? The cares of what? This life. So what they're, what they're going to try to impute into you and, and put into your soul? The cares of this life. They're going to try to make you care about this life. And the way most people make you care about this life is they try to make you care about them. That's why they act a complete fool around you. So you can be caught up in going back and forth with them about the junk that the devil is using through them to input into your mind to choke off the word you just received right here today. You won't even make it home good before the start up. You'll get a phone call in the car. Hey, what'd you do with my shoes? What shoes? I didn't even know you had any shoes. I haven't seen your shoes. I know you took them. You know, throwing them out or something. Those are my work shoes. It's designed to do what? Take that word right back out of your heart. You just got the engrafted word able to save your soul, but the devil has a litany of nuts, coops, and wackos designed to choke it off. And the Bible says it becomes what? unfruitful it's organic if you were just meditating on the word of God keeping your mind clear man you can let this word just grow and saturate you and change you so the devil sees anybody telling you the truth as a threat to the controller see if you got somebody controlling you I am their worst nightmare because I'm here to break the controls off of you they'll try to accuse me of controlling you because they do See, they don't want you to get free. I don't preach folks to me. I preach you to the Lord who will be able to make you free. But they don't like that because they are controlling you. So they got to take a course of action by illegitimately accusing me of doing what they're really doing. Did you not know most people doing wrong accuse somebody else of doing the wrong they're doing? That's a trick of the devil. These are the schemes of the devil. They hope that you have something in you that will respond to them. So you letting Price tell you all this stuff like you can't think for yourself. What are they trying to exploit in you? Pride. So they're making you believe that you need to raise up and don't nobody tell you what to do. You don't have to listen to them. You can think for yourself. All the while, they're trying to get you away from what's making you free. Of them. The whole world lies in who? The, the whole entire world lies in the hands of the wicked one. 
And he doesn't want anybody to make it to heaven when he's going to hell. He envies a saved person because you're going where he cannot go. And everybody like him that is lost don't, don't want you to make it. They don't want to see you make it in. Man, this is a dirty place. This is an evil place. This is a wicked place. So you got to be able to detect not what a person does, but the motivation behind what they do. Never listen to what they say. Begin to examine the motivation behind what they say. That's the real them. You got to look at their whole life. Look at how they live. Look at how they talk. Look at how they curse. Look at who they're comfortable around. That's the real them, see? Don't imagine them to be anything other than what the fruit of their life dictates to you to be real. Don't dream. Don't fantasize, especially you women. Don't think you can change a guy to make him better because you can't. You remember the old song years ago? What you see is what you get. And this is the real thing, baby. <laughs> that you're looking at. That's the real thing. Stop fantasizing about it being something other than what you're looking at. What you see is what you get. That's really them. They're really a drunk for real. They're really a dope fiend for real. They're really impugning your life for real. Did you not know that a lot of people are flawed and unable to cope with life because they've impugned their cognitive abilities from smoking dope? Cognition is the ability to recognize, evaluate, and make decisions based on your ability to use reasoning and all types of thinking processes to understand environmental things. But dope impugns your cognitive abilities. You take little kids like these kids here, like little Mackay, little Elena right there. So they're going through developmental stages where they're going through cognitive adjustments and cognitive abilities being formed in them. And them being around dope will impugn their abilities. And you'll see them become arrested because they got secondhand dope ingestion around a dope smoker. It impugns what? Cognitive development. Cognition. Look it up when you get home. Look up cognition. Look up cognitive impairment. Have you ever heard of recognition? You know what recognition is? Your mind pulling up data so you can know what's in front of you again. Like you said, I don't recognize you. Your mind is drawing a blank. It's not pulling up the information to have you recognize the person in front of you. And if you watch people that smoke dope, they have trouble remembering. They can't take tests and examinations. They give up on life and they settle for not being able to think. But guess what God can do? God can do what? Restore your soul. The damage you did to yourself, God can take the years, the locusts, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, the canker worm, and every other insect that ate away at you, the termites you let in to eat up your mind and brain. God can restore all that damage done. Some of y'all are gardeners. You ever seen a garden where the bulls have gotten to it? My wife always going out there spraying that stink stuff on the plants. Talking about these bulls, these beetles just eating up all of my stuff, man, all my flowers and all of my foliage. And you see holes all in the because they've been out there eating. And that's the same way demons do to your brain. They destroy what? Brain cells. They eat up an environment that they're not supposed to be in. So your brain and your mind are designed to hold the Holy Ghost. That's it. You let other spirits in. The damage is done because you let in unclean spirits that were not designed for the human soul. So they began to do what? Like termites eating away. Termites live off of wood ingestion. They eat up wood like a carpenter bee. A carpenter bee just like to drill holes and stuff. They dig, dig in holes. And just tear up your whole, you know, ver veranda outside of your, your little pergola 
They done ate up the whole thing, just drilling holes and everything. He said, why are you doing that? We, we like to nest up in the hole. They live up in the hole, so they got to make the hole to live in it. So you see, when you let demons into your life, your thinking processes get skewed. And you make decisions that are totally illogical. You try to figure out, why are they doing this? They're doing what they're doing because they think like they think. You're just a manifestation of how you think. So if the devil has intruded into your thinking processes, then your logic functions will be skewed. You will have illogical, Ill, irrational decisions being made because the demons have now embedded inside of you. And guess what the church avoids talking about the most? Demons. Churches don't talk about demons. You know why? Because the demons are in the preacher. And guess what? Satan ain't going to cast out Satan. A demon-infested preacher will never address demons. Just talk about love and grace and, you know, prosperity and your best life now and how to get a new car and a new house and a new relationships. And what, are, what is all that? Woman, thou art loose, but you're full of demons. The person telling you you're loose is full of demons. You got to conduct a warfare against the demons to see in a progression made in your life for real. So you see now, I can't get past one verse of scripture. And you can talk all day from one verse of scripture if you understand the Bible. See, the Bible is rich with information. But you got to move on because you try to save time. So the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sows good seed in his field. But while men slept, while men were not conscious, so you're not conscious when you're sleeping. While you were unconscious, his enemy came and sowed what? Tares among the wheat and went his way. So all he did, now look what he did. He didn't hang around. He just sowed the tares and left. He dropped the tares in and then evaporated into the background. Because it's all what? Organic. Whatever you sow, it's going to grow. You sow, it will grow. You are, a, you are a manifestation in sin of what was sown into you. So the devil put it in you as a child. You didn't know it. It sat down in you. But as you grew up, the thing grew up in you, as you. And finally, you carried out the dastardly deed of that demonic element sown into your psyche and into your soul as a child. That's why folks say, well, I feel... Like a woman inside of and I'm a man. That's been sown into them by some unclean spirit. You know, just because your kid talks about they feel like a girl, like Dwayne Wade's little boy, you don't respond to that and try to dress him in a dress and put on makeup and put on, no, man, hold it. Wait a minute. Something ain't right here. I got to go to war for my boy. But guess what? When you got the same spirit in you, you don't fight it. Because that's the same thing in you. This is what the devil's doing. He's bled away generations until any perversion in a child is accepted by the parent and the grandparent because the same perverse spirit is in the parent and the grandparent. So they're going to accept anything a child says because you're just like me. I'm bisexual. I'm transgender. I got a perverse spirit in me. So I'm not shocked by what's in you. Now they're trying to legitimize in Washington State a ability on your birth certificate just to mark you as X. Not male or female, not boy or girl, just X. Non-gender specific. And then you decide what you are as you grow because chromosomes don't determine gender. It's what you identify as. That's your agenda. And the hate speech is already in place in Canada now. If this man walks into your workplace and he says, I am a woman, address me as her and she. If you don't, you're traumatizing me and you can be arrested for hate speech and causing this man undue duress and trauma and stress on the job. Because you want to dress him as she and her. I'm already handcuffed in the back of the police cruiser. I'm already through.
I'm not doing that. I'm not going to let you drive me insane to, incom- to accommodate an insane world that Satan designed. I'm not doing that. You got to somewhere just set the limitation on what you're going to do. I'm not going any further. That's like somebody pushing you backwards until you get to the edge of a cliff. Now, how are you going to get take another push when you're going off a 3,000 foot drop? You got to somewhere, you got to draw the line and say, look, I'm not going any further with this. And that's where we're at right now. You got to draw the line and say, look, I'm not calling anybody a man that's a woman and vice versa, or a woman that's a man. I'm not doing that. Where did all this come from? That all of a sudden everybody got to buy into this. It's the eroding away of the mind by the demons. Put a hot frog in cool water and you let it turn up slowly the heat till it boils and the frog will boil to death, not being able to discern the temperature changes. You throw him in hot water, he'll jump out. But just let it slowly rise and he won't discern that slow temperature change. He'll slowly boil to death. And that's where people are. Folks have made adjustments as the devil has slowly changed society. A little bit at a time until now you live in a world gone mad. And insanity is in vogue. Insanity is the norm. And the same people are crazy. That's why it's a very few people going to make it. Because the sane people are the saved people. The insane people are the people that bought into the devil's depravity and went along to get along. I'm telling you, man, this is going to be interesting to watch this unfold. He says, tares were sown amongst them and the wheat were there too. And the sower of the tares went its way. But when the blade was sprung up, okay, now we got the development of what was sown. See, it sprung up in the field. The blade came up. And brought forth fruit. So the grain is what let you know that it was wheat. See, wheat produces grain, tares don't. Then appeared the tares also. So darnel is actually the tares. Darnel is false grain. It looks like wheat until the fruit show up. See, it looks, you can't tell the difference looking at it until you get to the fruit and the grain shows up. And you see it's really wheat as, as, a, as opposed to darnel or false grain. So now you can see you got tares. Basically weeds sown in amongst the wheat. And they grew up together. That's church. You can't, you can't rip up tares in the church. They're going to grow up side by side with the real authenticated people of God. So they'll look like they're saved and they'll look like they're saints, but they're not. Don't fool around with them. Trying to rip them out and get rid of them. You got to grow together. And and this Bible tells you why. Look at this. So the servants of the house, householder came and said unto him, sir, did not you sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had it tares? He said, man, you sowed good wheat. Where did the tares come from? He said unto them, talking to the servants, and in this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? So they're saying, okay, since an enemy sowed the the weeds and the tares, you want us to come and rip them out of the field? Look what the response is. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. You see how the damage would be done? If I was to go through here and start tearing the tares out of here, I'll damage the wheat. Now, if you got a babe in Christ, and they won't be able to take the calamity of dealing with the evil ones. Because they're going to be confused just getting in this thing and wondering, what's going on? I thought these were saved people. What is this? Don't even let them deal with all that. Just let everybody grow together. God's going to separate in due season. You just make sure what? That you ain't a tear. The only thing you're responsible for is making sure... I'm not a tear. I'm serious. Sincerity is your doorway into salvation. Did you know that? If you're sincere, you'll be saved. If you're a hypocrite and false, you're already damned. Because you're not for real. 
And God can identify who? The real. This one testimony stands sure. The Lord knows those that are his. And you can't fake it. Look at this. Let both grow together until when? The harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles for what purpose? To burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Gather the tares first because they're being bundled to burn them. And then we'll take the wheat and put it in my barn. So everybody going to grow up together to maturity. Now, when fruit is manifested, then you separate because you're plucking up everything in it. Well, you're harvesting. You see what I'm saying? Since everything has been harvested from the field, now you can pull up the whole field. But you separate at the time of harvest, bundle the tares to burn them, and bring the wheat on home. That's what's going to happen in the church. Don't get shook up by who's saved and who's not saved and who's for real and who's not for real. And I think they're a hypocrite. I think that's a lying preacher. I think these folks are phony. See, a lot of sinners use accusations against the phony to justify their sin. I ain't about in church for real. I grew up in church. They was all lying. The preacher had women pregnant. Everybody was lying and stealing and hoeing around. Ain't nothing to them church folk. Don't justify the righteous looking at the, at the, at the, at the Darnell, the tares now. Don't try to malign the righteous looking at the, at the tares. Don't tell God about what's wrong when you individually can do what's right. What they did don't have nothing to do with you. Don't tell God about anybody doing anything wrong when he's giving you the individual power to do what's right for you. You got to become a rugged individualist in this man. I don't know what anybody else did. All I know that Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. I serve him in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to obey what he tells me to do because I want to make it in. I don't know what the lying preacher is doing. That's not my problem. You'll never get by God trying to blame the wicked for your unrighteousness. I'm sinning because they're wicked. You see how stupid that is? If you hate the wicked, why would you be wicked to go to hell with the wicked? That's crazy. But that's what people do. They try to justify rebellion, false religions, filthy sin by blaming somebody else when God says I'm the standard you can't justify what you're doing by blaming a person because I'm not a person I'm not a man that I should lie neither I'm the son of man that I should repent if I said it I'll do it if I spoke it I will bring it to pass don't try to justify your sin by pointing your finger at what your mama did your daddy did the mo your mama took you to this lying church. Your mama did this. Your daddy did this. My uncle was this. My cousin was this. My uncle was a preacher and he molested me. My hey, look, don't have nothing to do with God. You better forsake that, forgive them, and, and get them out of your life and walk on with the Lord. This is an individual affair that cannot be faked. You got to make sure that you're in it for you. You got to get your mind so narrowed down that just you and Jesus in this and everybody else is on the circumference. They're on the perimeter. I walk with the Lord and then I deal with people. I don't deal with people and then walk with the Lord. You got to make the Lord the primary thing. Don't leave your first love looking at people. So you see how it all comes together. The gathering of the tares comes first. The tares are the spots and blemishes and wrinkles on the body of Christ. Remember, he says, I'm going to have a church with spot, without a spot, without a blemish, and without a wrinkle. The tares are the spots, the blemishes, and the wrinkles. You got to get them out of the way for God to have a purified church that's white as snow. He got to remove the blemishes and the damage that the tares bring into the universal church. What's happening? All of this is illustrating the cast of characters available at the end of the world. Notice he said that it's the harvest. It's the end of the world. 
whether he's going to gather this thing up and separate it. When the world ends, he's going to do it. So let's look at the cast of characters here. You got a man sowing good seed. You got an enemy that comes in to do things in the midst of his good seed. You got servants in his house that ask him about the tares being present in the field with the good seed. Then you got harvesters that come to gather in everything and separate the tares from the wheat. These are the cast of characters. And Jesus begins later to explain the cast of characters. Look at Matthew 13, 34. Skip down to verse 34. He says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So the prophet told us that he was going to do that, Psalm 78 too. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Explain to us what you meant by the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So the sower of the good seed is Jesus. That's the first character in our play. Jesus is the Son of Man that sowed the good seed. The field is the world. He's telling you the stage now. He's telling you where everything is taking place. The field is the world he's sowing the good seed into. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them, the tares, is the devil. So you see now what's happening Son of God, Jesus, sowing good seed. An enemy comes in, sows tares, and that enemy, the wicked one, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So you see the cast of characters now. As you see the dynamic unfold in the church and you're able to identify the wicked, evil children of the devil, they become more and more uh, uh, visible and you can understand who they are that means we're approaching the end of the world because the tares are ripening along with the wheat now the wheat is ripening simultaneously and if you're really saved you're going to find major deliverance is going to begin to take place in you you're going to begin to cast off everything that's binding you to the world because God is delivering you preparing to harvest you and fruit will begin to replace Everything that was detrimental to you. Every year you should cycle through some type of a growth stage that's going to divest you of what was holding you back and holding you down as God is ripening the wheat. That's what's happening right now. There is a segment of church life that's not going to be ripened because they're tares. They're going to become more and more Anchored to the evil of this world, preparing to be harvested by the person that sold them. See, the devil's going to use them and weaponize the tares against the wheat. They sit in your midst because they're going to be the accusers of the brethren. That's going to turn on the church. That's going to identify them as a tear. They've never liked God. They've never served God. They've never been saved. They only came in the midst in order to stop somebody from being saved. Everybody you bring to church ain't church material. You got to know God and know who God wants you to minister to because a lot of folks come into church in order to stop somebody from making it. You got to know that. Everything that looks like a saint ain't a saint. They're tares. So you can't be caught up in being rejected, downcast, needing people to validate you, needing somebody to love me and want me, needing somebody to show me affection, bleeding inside for somebody just to hold me at night. You're going to go to hell. 
behind that wounded heart that won't let God heal you up. See, to not let God heal up the wounds in you is a form of pride. I don't need the Lord. I'm going to tough it out on my own. And the only thing and the only person you can go to outside of God is the devil. And the devil can't heal you up because the devil's a wounded spirit. Wounded people never heal, the, heal up wounded people. They can only do what? Damage you more. They're going to add to your agony and your heartache because they're wounded themselves. The devil is wounded. The devil is rejected. The devil's been kicked out of heaven and can't get back. The devil has already been forecasted to go to hell forever. He's bitter. He's angry. He's full of malice. He's full of all kinds of negativity. He only does good things with a bad purpose in mind. If the devil does anything nice to you or for you, it's because he has a bad purpose in mind for you. So he does a temporary good thing with a long-term objective to destroy you. Every blessing did not come from God. That's why the Bible says what? Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. The devil can bless you to bind you. The devil can bless you to destroy you. The devil can bless you to deceive you. The devil can bless you to use you. The devil's pseudo false blessings are all determined and all designed to make sure you don't get saved. And if you got saved, that you won't stay saved. That's why you can't use outward parameters. You can't use other folks to validate you. You can't need a signature from another human to sign off on your existence. You've got to be whole in Christ. In him, you've got to live and move and have your being. You've got to sell out to Jesus Christ and let him complete you. He that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You've got to begin with Christ. You've got to end with Christ. And you can't import people in order to enhance your relationship with Jesus Christ. You only need Jesus alone. And now you can deal with people from that perspective. Don't need to get married. Don't need to. Because the devil going to deceive you. I need somebody. I can't live without them. They're my everything. You're going to make a bad mistake making another human being your everything because every human being is flawed. And they are going to do what? Let you down. That's like if I depended on my wife to cook me breakfast every morning. <laughs> Some morning she's going to wake up and say, I don't feel like getting up cooking no breakfast. I think some eggs and sausages in there somewhere. You better go down there and try to find you something. Brother. I'm tired, man. I'm beat. I was up all night with the baby last night. And that baby sleep. I just put the baby down. It was sleep for about two hours. That would give me two hours. And I ain't getting up for nobody. I don't think God can get me up out of this bed right now. See, that's how it's going to be. But see, I'm depending every month, 6.30, I need my breakfast on the table, piping hot. That ain't going to happen. Folk get married in fantasy. Folk don't feel like fooling around with you all the time. Folk don't always feel like talking to you. <laughs> you don't have much to say. You got an attitude. I just don't feel like talking to nobody. See, that's what I'm saying. See, I thought we were supposed to be one. Now, look, why don't you go and find something to do? bothering people that's life that's real man but if you reject it you take everything to heart you know man get out, get over all that stuff you got to get your mind real back in to understand that people are flawed people are going to change people go through emotional states every day is not the same sometimes you feel like you do sometimes you don't like that candy bar whatever that was what was that? A, what kind of Kit Kat or Almond Joy? Okay. <laughs> sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. But that's about this. Yeah, that's a really good description too. You know. <laughs> so you see now, the enemy that sold them is the devil, 
The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. Don't get it twisted. If he said it, he meant it. Jesus does not waste any words. At the end of the world, all the false Christians are going to be gathered and bundled together, and he's going to burn them. He's going to burn them up. That's going to happen just like he said it. You don't have to fantasize, don't theorize. If he said it, he's going to do exactly what he said. Now, I just don't want to be in that bundled bunch of tares. Because there won't be any reprieve at the end. He's going to do exactly what he said. He's not going to change his mind. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Everybody professing and practicing lawlessness. Every disobedient person, every rebel is a tear. They won't do what he said. And you can always tell them because their affections are in the world. They think monetary gain and possessions and flexing for the people around them is important. Always trying to impress somebody in the world and look like something, that's a tear. They're not into Jesus Christ. And if you are into Jesus Christ, they're not into you. I don't care what they say out of their mouths. Because they can't like you if you serve the Lord and they hate the Lord and won't serve him. It ain't going to happen. It won't mix like that. If you're a friend of God and they're a friend of the world and the Bible says the friend of the world is the enemy of God and you're a friend of God, guess whose enemy they are? Yours. And they're going to strive and they're going to plot and they're going to connive and they're going to slick and trick and look for ways to deceive you and undermine your relationship with Christ to make sure you don't make it. That's why you got to be weaponized inside for your salvation. You got to fight for your salvation. You can't let anybody intrude into your salvation. You got to make your calling and your election sure. Nobody is worth going to hell for. Ain't nobody that fine. They ain't built nobody that fine. I don't care what you built like. I don't care. I don't care what you bought from Brazil and down in Mexico and sold on to you. You ain't that fine to go to hell for. No. Now you can bat them bat wing eyelashes all you want. You got glued on your eyes. I'm not going to hell for your bat wings batting in my face. You got to get for real about your salvation, man. He says, look, he's going to bundle these folk up and burn them. Everything that's offensive and doing iniquity going to gather it up and burn it. Then he says in verse 42, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's a promise. They're going to really be wailing and crying out in hell. And they're going to have teeth to gnash. Have you ever read that? They got teeth still in hell? Gnashing them together? You got a body, but it's now an eternal body. It's got teeth in it to chew with, but you ain't going to have no food. Man, don't save me none of this. Then shall the righteous, after the darnel, after the tares are removed, then shall the righteous do what? Shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's letting you see now that to some degree the tares are causing a dimming of the light. Them being around the church are somehow inhibiting the shining forth of the glory of the church but when he removes those tears when he removes that film from the church that unclean thing it's like having something over the top of a bulb that's like a film of dust or dirt you don't get the full what illumination of the bulb because it's, the light is shining through this film so you remove that film and that debris and boy the full intensity of the bulb just lights up that's what the church is going to be, be like. It's going to be a glorified church. This is going to be amazing to watch it unfold. Jesus Christ is going to do all of this just like he said. Look at verse, jump down to verse 47. He says again, 
The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So you gather up everything, you keep the good and throw the bad away. So you see how the church is a harsh part of the bad and the good together? Don't look around at other folks to determine your salvation because the good and the bad, the wheat and the tares are bundled together right now. You got to get in for you. There is a degree of self-advancement uh, and self-fulfillment and literally selfishness in your existence and salvation because you got to make sure you get in before you get anybody else in. I got to make sure I'm anchored and solid before I can lend a hand to pull you into a realm of solid life. I got to make sure I'm on solid ground before I save you. So you got to do that for yourself. He says, you gather everything up together in one vessel, then you cast out the bad and keep the good. So shall it be at the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever, separate the wicked from among the just. That word for sever is to exclude or fence off. They're going to build a fence around the just that won't allow the wicked to come in. And the angels will do this. It's going to be supernatural. There'll be some type of a supernatural force where the wicked can't intermingle with the just anymore. They're going to be ostracized and kept out. And God's going to reject the wicked after he has offered them salvation repeatedly and they wouldn't accept it. He's going to finally come to the point of, you can't be saved. I don't want you. See, Jesus Christ and his father can get to the point that if you want to get saved, they don't want you now. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. The reprobate mind can settle in and there is no salvation for you because I extended my hand to you, sped in my hand. All these years, now I don't even want you. And if nobody can minister to you, nobody can preach to you, nobody can save you, you can't repent, the door has been closed to you as an individual. See, it's dangerous, man, to play with salvation. Because God says, you better come to me while I'm, while I'm available. When my hand is extended, you better accept my extended hand. Because I can cut you off forever. He says, I'm going to sever the wicked from the just and shall cast them into to the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, if Jesus Christ is repeatedly saying the same thing, you better take that to heart and not blow it off. This is going to be terrifying. It's going to unfold just like he said it. What will it look like? Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Let's take a look at how the end time will look. As everything begins to unfold. Got a fussing little baby. <laughs> Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were what? Passed away. And there was no more sea. So you understand now this world, this earth we're looking at is going away. He saw a new heaven and new earth. This one is gone, and there's no more Atlantic Ocean, no more Pacific Ocean, no more Indian Ocean. All the seas and waterways are gone. I don't know why, but the new heaven and new earth are void of seas, according to the Bible. You know, they just came up with a new ocean. Now there are six oceans. It used to be five. Around the Antarctic, they just... Uh, decree that there's the southern ocean down there that circles the Antarctic down on the southern part of the globe. So now you got five oceans instead of, I mean, six oceans instead of five. That's brand new. Well, you, if you take a test somewhere and you want to sound brilliant, <laughs> there are, I, uh, excuse me, there are six oceans now, sir, professor. There are six oceans now. And you'll look real deep in your class. So you see now, there's no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So you see, the New Jerusalem is the bride. 
There's a present day Jerusalem in Israel, but there's a new Jerusalem coming. So don't think that the Jerusalem in Israel is the final allocation for God's folk. It's a new one coming in a new heaven and a new earth. That's going to be the kingdom of God coming down to replace everything you see that's been defiled by the devil as a satanic uh, filthy ruler here. God's going to wipe the whole place out and start over again. Old things will pass away and behold, all things will be made new. No defiling element, nothing unclean. I fathom there'll be no fish because there won't be any seas to hold them. I don't know what this existence will be like. Your mind, and you don't even know this now, your mind, if you're really saved, is being refabricated in your salvation experience to change you to be able to walk in this. Your thinking processes are being worked on, but you just don't know it. He's transforming your mind to accept a new existence that's eternal at the expense of the temporary existence down here. That's why the world begins to grow strangely dim to you. Because your mind is becoming a mind that's transcended. It's ascending from here slowly by God to leave this stuff behind. Now, consider the contrast between you and a person that loves the world. How you see life versus them. It's like if a woman was married to an unsaved guy and he thinks that material possessions is, are somehow impressing her. And she's trying to tell him, I don't care about none of that. That stuff don't move me no more. I was in the world, I had the shoes, I had the purses, I had the gold chains, I had the rings. I bought myself a diamond ring in the, in the world. I, I had a nice car. I had my own home. There's nothing you could buy me and give me to impress me from down here. That's because your mind is now what? It's transcending time and space. You don't care anymore. What used to make you something is now nothing to you. That's supernatural. That is a supernatural work being done to your mind where those red sole shoes are not a big deal to you. You can have 20 pair of them and they don't matter to you. And a person looking at you can't understand that because they're where? In the world. Trying to impress people where? In the world. Trying to look like something where? In the world. It'll happen all by itself. Your conversation will show forth that you're a world citizen and you love the world. And the Bible tells us explicitly in, in the Bible, 1 John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is all of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But only he that doeth the will of God shall abide and live forever. James 4, 4. You're a friend of the world. You're an enemy of God. Happens all by itself. So a, a person won't be able to adapt to you when you have been born again, and as that new life begins to organically grow in you, it grows at the expense of the old life. So you're going to expand the presence of Jesus in you as you let go of this world. Because what's he after? A new heaven and new earth coming down, not this one. You're being prepared for an eternal city, a celestial city, and you're giving up the terrestrial city. So you're transcending time and space and moving on to the eternal, even while in this mortal body. It'll happen on the inside of you. The things they care about, you just don't care, care about anymore. You should be a sports fanatic. I look at the game, but it, it ain't all that. I like the Hawks. I want the Hawks to win, but I don't care if they lose. I'm not going to be at home upset and in anxiety and biting my fingernails to the quick because they lost. <laughs> you see, but some people... They're throwing stuff through glass plate windows, cursing folk out, yelling, screaming. Because they're in the world. Nothing down here matters that much. Your job. They'll threaten you about losing your job. You know how many jobs exist down here? You get fired tomorrow. Amazon is there. They'll hire Amazon tomorrow morning. 16, 15 hours. Not even offering a signing bonus in Amazon, like it's a football team or something. I was just talking to somebody in the hallway. 
They got a job, sixteen fifty an hour, uh, phone center, at working from home. Now that's the perfect world to live in right there. Anytime you can work somewhere with nobody bothering you, you got the perfect job. Don't nobody talk to me. Don't nobody see me. Don't nobody say nothing to me. They can pull my stats from offline about what I did without talking to me. Well, you're living in high cotton then. Because nobody bothering you. Why don't you leave people alone? Some people flex on the job just because they can. What time did you get back from lunch? Where have you been? You weren't at your desk. I just came by your, your, uh, your office. Huh? The restroom. You used the restroom? You had the nerve to use the restroom in here? See, some people are crazy, man. And you want to avoid the crazy at all costs. So you see now this new Jerusalem, a new heaven, new earth. You got to be consciously aware of the fact that God is transcending this place. He's delivering you from the evil of the world and you don't even know it. You monitor yourself and you find out that the horizontal things don't impact you like they used to. Your child used to just make you just mad and you was all nervous and worked up and getting ready. And now it's like they don't even exist. You're being delivered. But if they still can affect you, you're not delivered yet. That's how you monitor yourself. It's a built-in safety check about where your heart really is. And I heard a great voice out of heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, the abode of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. He will live with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. God will be with them. His dwelling place, his home has come down to them. They'll be his people and he will be their God. God has brought heaven down. He didn't bring heaven to earth. He displaced this present earth with another earth and another heaven. It's total replacement, displacement of what used to be. A whole new time of, type of existence wherein you'll have a celestial body Traded in for a terrestrial body. This flesh and blood is going to be traded in. Remember, before you can get out of here, you got to be changed in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed into a celestial being. You don't even know what you're made of at that point. You're going to be a whole other type of material. You know it can walk through walls because Jesus in a celestial body walked through a physical wall. You're going to transcend the physics of time and space. You're going to be another kind of a being. You can actually go to Pluto from here unless God has replaced Pluto even I don't know what the heavens being replaced will look like he might be replacing all the galaxies all the star systems I don't know but whatever it is it's going to transcend the existence down here in a temporal physical world you'll be a whole nother kind of being with all these real superpowers see superpowers will be normal to you no telling what you'll be able to do that you don't know about yet. But you'll be in another kind of body. And I think what Derek Prince says about this is probably accurate. He says, I believe a celestial body, a heavenly body, is a body with no blood in it. Because you don't need blood because the life of the flesh is what? The blood. Blood carries oxygen through your body to make your body thrive and make you alive. Cut off blood from your finger, this finger will die. Because no blood is going into it. So in another kind of body that's heaven based. That's not made of the soil of the ground. And not needing oxygen to supply it. You don't need blood. How do I know you don't need oxygen? Because Jesus went to heaven. There ain't no oxygen up there. Because you don't need oxygen. We need it on earth. Not in heaven. So a body without blood. Has instant transmission from your spirit. Right to that celestial body without a gearbox in your blood to make you have to operate. In other words, your mind appended to your spirit doesn't have to operate through your soul to get things done. See, if you want to do something, if you, if you will it with your spirit sitting right here, your spirit has to, through your mind, communicate with your brain and your brain carries the signal to your hand to move it. Instantaneous now, from our perspective, but there's a lot of stuff going on just to move your hand. You will it with your spirit man. You are a spirit. Your spirit man 
is appended to your mind. Your mind couples with the physical world in your brain. That's where the contact is made from the spirit to the natural world. It's in your brain and your mind connect. When your spirit operates the mind, the mind couples with the brain and you do a physical thing. This is why we lay hands on people to transmit power to deliver folks or heal folks. That's your spirit man willing it's your mind telling your brain to lay hands on them. And then from your spirit, God transmits his power through your bloodstream out of your hand into that person to heal them. That's why Jesus said, I felt virtue go out of me. I felt it leave me. I could feel the transmission of the power coming out of me. Somebody lay hands on you to cast out a demon. You can feel the duress and the stress come on your soul because the demon inside of you goes into what? Duress. You can feel it. You, sometimes you can feel it pulling on you because it's holding on. It's really holding on to you, not try, trying not to go. And you can feel that. That's why people say, ah, because it's pulling on them. They are the duress. They're being stressed out. They're being tormented. I love it. I love everything about it. Look how much they tormented you. They cry out because of the stress and the duress they're under. That torment because the Holy Ghost is impacting them. That's why you can really tell something is in you. You can actually feel it in you. You can feel it pulling. Those talons are dug into your soul saying, I don't want to go. So that's where the spirit world and the physical world interact. You can actually feel the presence of spirits in you if the Holy Ghost manifests in the spirit realm to confront them spiritually and they're holding on to a physical tabernacle and you're going to feel the stress on them trying to, not to let go. God will up the power and drive them out. Now, if you're stupid enough to let them come back, that's on you. Because the Bible says the unclean spirit is going to do what? Going to come back to look for the, the content of that vessel it left to see what kind of condition you're in when it comes back to see if it has a way to re-enter because you haven't been filled with the power of God to displace once in you with God's presence. So you got to understand that that everything is always in play. Once you, get, once you get delivered, the devil's always looking for a re-entry point to get back in again. So you got to keep yourself pure. You got to keep yourself sanctified. You got to keep yourself in a place of holiness, not to let the devil have access back to your soul because he's always going to circle you looking for a way to get back what he lost. It's a warfare. But understanding now that the merging of the spirit realm and the physical realm is always in play. You talk to a lot of devils all day. You got devils you live with at your house. They talk to you all day. And here you are trying to understand what the devil just said through this person. And you're trying to figure out, I wonder why they see that like that. That didn't make any sense. Well, that's a devil talking to you. The devil manifests in physical form. He's talking through people to try to undermine you. And if you are not able to discern it, here you are trying to understand the warped, convoluted, insane mind of the devil trying to transmit information to you that's defiled and unclean and crazy coming from the mind of Satan. Man, I don't have time for that. God's going to be with us. God shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Man, that's good news. No more pain. For the former things, everything that exists now, are passed away. So everything you define as living on earth is gone. No more crying, no more pain, no more poverty, no more sickness, no more starvation, no more negativity. Every unclean, filthy, lying, no good person, everything that you defile is wicked, unclean, and satanic, wiped away. I don't even know what that's going to look like. But I sure like to experience a time when the devil ain't bothering your mind. The devil ain't trying to bother you. Nobody cursing at you. Nobody crazy around you. And man, you finally got peace that surpasses all understanding embedded in your persona. And you can walk around free as a bird with nobody bothering you for the first time in your life. All the former things are passed away. 
And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. All things, everything is new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Everybody thirsty that want to drink of this eternal fountain, I'll give them the water without charge. You can drink your fill. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. Everything is yours. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But, now here we go. But the fearful, now everybody that's on the positive side of God is available and to be seen from verse 1 through 7. But here are the tares. Here are the defiled. Here are the unclean. Here are the rejected talked about in verse 8. Everybody between verse 1 and 7 are the people, the children of the kingdom of God. But you get to verse 8, you get to the tares. You get to the evil ones. You get to the satanic seed, the children of the devil. But the fearful and unbelieving. First two, show me fear, I'll show you unbelief. Show me unbelief, I'll show you fear. The fearful and the unbelieving, that's not a neutral type state of being. You fear because you don't believe God's word. That's why you get afraid. Now you watch how many church folk want to turn back as the final conflict unfolds. Because they never were believers. They didn't believe what he said was going to happen. Therefore, they didn't prepare for it. If you believe what God foretold, you're making preparation for it now. That's why you fasting. That's why you spend your time on the prayer line every night. I didn't take the admonition lightly. The prayer line was available. I'm availing myself of it because I'm getting ready for what's about to happen while other folks sit around and never get into the thing. The prayer line been going on all the time. The same group of people on it every night. But the other folks, I oh, didn't no big deal. Yeah, you know. Case of rah, sir, rah. And the folk that's for real, they pray every night. Because they're looking to be changed because it's been foretold to me what's coming down the pike. I'm making preparation for it. He says, consider the ant, you lazy sluggard, and be wise. He stores up when? In the summertime to prepare for the wintertime. What happened with Joseph in Egypt? He told Pharaoh what? Seven years of what? Plenty and there'll be seven years of lack. The seven years of lack are the tribulation period. Store up in the plenteous years to make preparation for the years of lack. So everybody that's serious and believing right now are doing what's necessary for what's about to happen. And guess what? You're watching it unfold. You're watching the nanoparticles shot into the folks to make them ready to be part of a new cyber network as 5G comes on to turn on the human to plug you into the system. You're watching them tell you without a certain vaccination, you can't be a, allowed to come in and interact with us. The separations are being made. You're watching homosexuality and lesbianism and all the transgenders now say, we are the people and you have to accept us or else. You're watching the whole culture, the civilization change to be just like God said it would be. The days of Noah and the days of Lot. You're watching it and still not making preparation. Still what? An unbeliever. And at the end, you're going to be crippled with what? Fear, Isaiah 33, 14, he says what? The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has overtaken who? The hypocrite. The sinners are afraid. The unbelieving hypocrite is now somewhere just trapped. Fear. Fear. Sinners, hypocrites, fear. Why? They were unbelievers. They never believed the report. Says in Isaiah 53, first thing he says, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To get the revelation of God's strength, you got to believe what he said. First two going to hell. 
you think it'll be an adulterer, a fornicator, or something like that, the first two are the fearful and the unbelieving because it's cause and effect. You were afraid because you didn't believe. You didn't believe because you were afraid. What were you afraid of? I didn't believe God because I was afraid to be rejected by this world. I couldn't take them ostracizing me. I couldn't take the threats they levied on me if I didn't do what they said. I went alone to get alone. I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to be seen different by my family. I was afraid to be different. I was afraid to be labeled as a holy roller, a fanatic. You take it too, too seriously. It don't take all of that. I needed the approval of man above God. So I didn't believe God. I had to believe what man said in order to be accepted by man. No, buddy. You better learn to walk alone, eat your lunch alone at work. Bring your own food and sit in the corner by yourself. Drive in your car alone. Be at the family gathering alone. Go to the family reunion and sit alone. I don't do your stuff. I don't want to listen to your music. I don't want to drink your Hennessy. I don't want to be part of none of this. I'm not like you, and I like it like this. I'm all right by myself. You got to become a person, man, that can be all right with just you and God. You and God is always a majority. You don't need all the other people to sign off on your existence. And they always trying to pull you in to the herd. You know why? Because you standing on God's word alone is an affrontery to their sin. I got to make you what I am because you bear witness against me just by your existence. Your proclivity to stand for God and stand on righteousness offends me all by itself. You can be in a home with somebody that's anti-Christ and anti-God and your very presence offends them. They just don't have the nerve to tell you. They don't like you because they don't like God. It's not you doing it. You're just faithful to God. You can't even, don't even prove to them that you're faithful to God. Just remain faithful to God. Don't have those conversations trying to tell them what they need to do because they don't want to do it. Nobody's ignorant of what's going on. They choose not to do it. They were privy to the same information you're privy to, but they rejected it as an unbeliever. They're always going to hate the vessel that brings the information. That's why you learn to walk in this thing as a hated commodity. It don't bother me. I'm not here to talk to the world at large. I only talk to God's people. I'm not here for them. You're sent to the lost sheep of Israel that can receive the Savior, not to the goats. The goats are not part of the sheepfold. Accept it. Embrace it. Walk in it. The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. Look at everybody coming in this thing now. And all liars shall have their part where? In the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You die one time physically, he going to resurrect you and then send you to hell the second time as a second death. So you died one time physically 300 years ago. At the end of the age, you're going to resurrect you and bring you back alive and then send you eternally to hell. And hell is poured into a lake of fire for finality. And the Bible says the smoke from that pit will billow up all, all the time to let you know it's burning. With all the folk in there wailing and gnashing of teeth in eternal torment. Some folks say, I don't see how nobody could do that to somebody. You're not a God. So therefore, you'll never understand. He's going to do exactly what he said. You better try to avoid that with everything you've got. Because he's going to do exactly what he said. Historically, God has always done exactly what he said. Now we're in this parenthetical age of grace. And when he turns it back on again to bring everything to pass those final seven years, you're going to find the things that Jesus said and what Revelation said are going to turn on. It's going to begin to happen. And you're seeing the build up right now for the final separation. When you get some folks to make up their mind to do what? 
come out from amongst them for real and become the church, you are not going to be able to fathom the fear that's going gra- to grab some people's hearts. You see people make up their mind to really do this, it's going to be a contingent of church folk going to be terrified because now the thing is really happening and I didn't make ready. I didn't, I, I didn't think it was serious. I've just been trained all my life to go to church, join the choir, listen to preaching, I didn't think that it was going to really happen in my lifetime. Revelation is some distant thing going to happen one day to somebody. I didn't think I'd live through it. I didn't think I would close the age. And here the age is closing up around you. $30 trillion debt in this nation. No money. They still just telling you they're sending you money. There's no money to send. They used to say they print it up. They don't even print it up. They just electronically transfer nothingness to you. They send it to your account with electronic coding, and nothing went. It's just electronics. Not even the dollars move anymore, because there are no dollars. It's all fake. Everything make believe. They're living in a fantasy world of sleight of hand and magicians operating all kinds of spells, thinking it's real, and none of it is real. Don't you see they got all these billionaires? Kim Kardashian's a billionaire. Jay-Z's a billionaire. You know it ain't real. Nothing that's real. You can't, they can't go and get a billion dollars tomorrow morning and put it on the table because it's all stocks, evaluation of companies, all this stuff is on paper. They're billionaires. So the, 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 the papers and the magazines are pinned billionaire status to them and you, you believe it. That's crazy. It's crazy. And you see it don't bring peace to their hearts. They say Kim Kardashian worth a billion dollars, Kanye West worth, worth $1.3 billion, and they can't even stay together. $2.3 billion, and that didn't do it. Ain't no peace to the wicked. The Bible says there's no peace, no peace to the wicked. The money can't do it. Money can't buy you love nor happiness. And we're watching the world trying to use money as a litmus test for both, and it always fails. So you see what's happening now, the environment in the world right now. It's letting us know where we stand. Homosexuality is the status of the day. Did you not know in the Greco-Roman Empire to be a bisexual was status quo? Caligula, one of the Roman emperors, when he had kids, he didn't give them a gender. He appended a gender to them as he saw fit. He he would name a, a boy a girl or a girl a boy based on what Caligula said they were because Caligula was a god. Most of those guys had concubine young boys along with women and wives. They were bisexuals. If you study people, androgyny and bisexuality is taking hold of folks. They're no longer one singular gender. Bisexuality is in vogue. They get married like that, both of them bisexual, so if they have an outside partner of the same sex, it doesn't offend the husband or wife because they get married as bisexuals. That's why you're looking at something that's crazy in front of you trying to figure it out. You can't figure out this crazy world of androgyny. Let it go. It's the warped world of the devil who is the Baphomet, and the Baphomet himself is androgyny. He's got the breast of a woman and the penis of a man. It's androgyny. It's taking hold of people. Look at the young sprinter right now. Shakira Richardson just qualified for 100 meters for the U.S. Olympic team. She says she's bisexual. And her girlfriend picked out her flaming red hair color in her race she just won. Nobody flinches. Willow Smith, the daughter of of, uh, Jada Piggott Smith and... uh, uh, what's his name? Will Smith. She says she's polyamorous. Polyamorous means many lovers. She can love several people. So the best thing for her to do is to marry a man and a woman because she's polyamorous. She can love both genders equally. And she just loves people. And, and there is no gender in her life. She's non-gender specific. She just loves. And nobody flinches. See, the heat on that frog has been slowly turned up. Now, we walk around in mass insanity, and if you're sane, you're abnormal. 
Now it's bleeding into the judicial system where the judges are coming down with all kinds of decisions based on that being the way it is. So in the law enforcement, uh, in the law enforcement realm, where policemen and police women are like this, you're about to be the odd person out if you're a child of God and you have gender identity. So you're seeing homosexuality, people being non-binary, meaning non-binary means I'm neither male nor female, I'm non-binary. I don't accept being male or female, I'm, I don't have a gender, you can't identify me. I'm transgender, meaning I crossed over from being a man to a woman and a woman to a man. So I, trans means to go across, I crossed over. And they're non-gender specific, and they made that normal. You get polyamorous as a new word, bisexual as the word to describe them, pansexual or cross-sexuality. So I don't know, who, I just, I can be, as a pansexual, I can be with a, if I'm a woman, I can be with a lesbian woman, I can be with a straight man, I can be with a homosexual man, and I can be with a straight woman. I don't know what you call that. Pansexual, I'm just with anything, anybody. I can be a woman with a man that's a transvestite. I don't even know what you call that. You got guys marrying guys who have got breast implants but still got a penis. So he's standing there with a wig on as a drag queen with breasts and a penis, and that's your partner. That's your wife. See, we in a realm, man. We're in a realm that nobody don't want to identify and talk, talk about and try to just ignore it. The world has gone mad right before your very eyes. And you're walking around in this every day. And you don't know what's on your jaw. You don't know who your boss is. You don't know what's really going on in the Senate and in the Congress and in the judiciary system. You don't know what the Supreme Court justices really are. You don't know none of this. But you see the results of it manifesting in front of you, trying to figure out What's really going on? And God is telling you in Romans chapter 1 what's going on. They're headed toward reprobation and bundling to be burned by God. So you got to extract yourself now, man. You better get out of this and you better get out now while they're getting this good. In that world, chromosomes don't determine gender. Your feelings do. See, XY chromosomes determine your gender. In a biological world that's run and designed by God. But in their world, it's what you feel and identify as that determines what you are. Now, do you know how crazy that is? I'm a man, but I feel like a mule. I identify as being a mule. Who's to question me in that realm? You see what I'm saying? You can't judge me. That's why they say that all the time. Because my feelings govern me, and how you feel governs you, so there are no absolutes. Everything is what? Relative. It's all about relativity. It's about how you feel, how you perceive it. It's no absolutes. Nobody can be absolute. It's how I feel. It's what I am. It's my identity. Who are you to question me? There is no standard. Why? Because there is no God. I'm an unbeliever. I don't, I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. So I determine what's right or wrong for me. And you don't have the right to question me and my identity. That's the world we're living in right now. It ain't futuristic. It's now. So you got to make the adjustments in your mind that when you're talking to somebody and they defend homosexuality, they defend bisexuality, they defend lesbianism, that's what they are. You're talking to it. Stop trying to kid yourself. Anybody that defends it, they are that. So tr stop trying to pretend the person you're talking to is something other than what they are. You stand with what you are and against that which intrudes upon what you are. Get it clear in your mind. We're living in a demon-possessed world. These are demons. Everything I just described is demonic. Why? Because demons don't have gender. Demons are spirits. 
They're non-gender specific, so they got to get a human that has no gender identity for them to live in that human and manifest as they desire to. Demons will have sex with horses, dogs, cows, pigs. They're not human. They can practice bestiality and don't feel nothing about it because they're not human. And they can transfer that same appetite to a human and have you out there like an animal, craving things that you never thought you'd crave because those things are living in you. You see, the devil, when he puts demons in a human, he knows he's going to have a delayed reaction because of resistance. See, when a demon comes into you that's unclean with a filthy, crazy appetite, the devil accounts for the fact that your natural human inclination is going to be to resist that demon's appetites. So he knows that. So what does he do? He don't start you off with the absolute appetite of the demon because you won't do that. So he starts you off slowly. Getting engaged in something perverse, a little masturbation, a little pornography, a little oral sex, a little anal sex. Try this. Now try these sex toys. Now try this. Now look at that. Listen to what they're saying on the red table talk with Jada Pinkett Smith and her mama and her daughter. In just that for about six months. Now look at Wendy Williams and see what she's saying. In just a little of that. Read Essence. Now read a little Cosmo. Now he's breathing and, and bleeding his ways into your life. Until the, your resistance is lowered. Your inhibitions are lowered until finally that demon is standing up in, in, inside of you fully taking over you with the appetites flourishing and determining your life. And now you'll do anything. You got young girls out there right now that will do anything. They got no morality. There's nobody judging me. If it feels good, I do it. I do as I like. They sing songs saying you can do whatever you like. It's all about what you say is good for you. They'll do anything. You can meet them at the mall at 5 o'clock and lay down with them by 5.15. Just get their hair done, get their nails done, buy them a new bag and some stilettos, and they'll be around the corner at your apartment by 5.15. No, mor no moral, cold, Done nothing wrong. It ain't nothing but a little sex. Go out to your car. Have sex with you in the back seat. In the, in the parking lot of the mall. Because you bought them a handbag. Get up. Put the clothes on. Go back into the mall. Always shopping. Always got a hook in the, in the ocean. Looking for a fish to catch. Because they live off of getting stuff from guys. And lesbian women. See they're not gender specific. They don't care who provides the stuff. Because they're non-gender specific. They live out there hunting for unstable souls to get stuff from. They'll just appease and please your sexual appetite. That's what they live for. We're in a whole nother world. You go to the mall, you see them everywhere. People don't dress like that normally. They always, what? Soliciting. The Bible calls what? The attire of a harlot. The clothing of a harlot. I'm for sale. I got on all this stuff showing every orifice of my body because I'm shopping for who wants this. Now you got to trade off some money or some goods for my services. It's the barter system. I trade off sexual favors for me getting stuff from you. You will be amazed at how many daughters are just like this. You just don't know it. Your daughter changed clothes when she goes somewhere. She went, left home looking one way. When she got with her friends, you wouldn't even recognize your own daughter, what she put on. She out there with a mini dress on, so short you can see her tonsils with, tonsils with no underwear on. Sitting with her legs wide open to show guys all her private parts and let them know you can get this if your money right. And her girlfriends egging her own. Telling them, yeah, this is how you live, baby. This is what you got to do. You know, no boots, no loot. No money, no honey. And they think they're living as bosses. See, they think they're bosses. They think they're on top of their game. They, they're moving and shaking as whores. 
They worshiped people like Cardi B. Cardi B was a stripper and a prostitute. Now she sat on a pedestal before all these young girls. And these young girls are now doing what? Conforming to the image of Cardi B. They got tattooed down their whole side like Cardi B is from, from, from a shoulder down to her thighs. This all coming out the strip joint. This all coming out of prostitution. They've been trained by the environment to prostitute themselves. And see, God will step in and deliver you from that, get your mind back into normal status, and set you free because you're bound. You're enslaved by spirits of prostitution. This stuff ain't funny. When this stuff grabs a hold of you, you're destined for a life of disease and infirmity and insanity. But they don't tell you that part of it. They don't tell you how many of the stars are diseased up. They don't tell you that part. They don't tell you that part. They don't tell you who died of a disease, an STD. They don't tell you that part. They just make it all famous, all flash, all glamour, all bright lights in Hollywood. But they don't tell you the other part. The devil don't ever tell you the other part. But sometimes you see a Whitney Houston bleed through. You see her daughter die the same way she did. You see Michael Jackson die before he's 50 years old. Good Prince right behind him. Luther Vandross eating alive. Elvis Presley dead, then Cliff 40 good. You see what happens, but everybody does what? They block it out their mind. I don't want to think about that. I don't like you bringing that part of it up. Why? Because I'm participating in the same activity that they participated in, and I got the same results coming my way, but I block it out of my mind because I want to feel good. And you don't make me feel good by what you say. I'm not here to make people feel good. I'm here to tell the truth about it. You got a, a psychological assault on women right now, and their self-worth and their value is under assault. It's bad, man, when you got the whole world assaulting women and their self-worth based on the environment telling you you don't measure up to the standards they set. Don't you know most of these folk got fake bodies that they bought and paid for? And then they tell you you don't measure up. Man, you, you can build a body in any laboratory around. All those synthetics... It's like prosthetics on these folk, man. You know what I'm saying? You got all this stuff, man, on you, and you bought all this stuff, and you assembled it back. You had to assemble it at your house before you put it on. Go to the, the beauty supply store. Got underwear with butts in it. I, I walked in there one day to get some grease, and I'm looking. I walked past the thing, and I'm, I looked again. At booty pop drawers. And they get big as you want them now. They, you get them huge if you want them, you know, the ultra deluxe size. All that walking around out there ain't real. You can get synthetic breasts in a bra. You know that? You can put it in a bra and put that thing on. Yeah, buddy, you looking like coming down the mall looking crazy. Come on, man, what's wrong? It's the devil taking folks' minds over. He's driving folks half crazy to measure up to some standard that is crazy. This is why as a woman, you got to just anchor yourself in God. Let God make you you and just walk in it. Just be you and be satisfied. Normal. You know and I know if you walk around as a woman, body parts is going to make folks yell at you. These guys out here full of love, they're going to yell at you. And nothing you can do about that. But you can control the insides of you and what you feel about yourself. You got complete autonomy there. You got control over the inside of you because the Holy Spirit can govern you that you don't need their affirmation and their validation and them yelling at you anymore. You used to have to have that because you were nothing and you needed outward confirmation about who you were. But when the Lord makes you whole, you don't need them affirming you any longer. And you can just be you. You can get up, fix your hair, put your clothes on, and walk out and be you. You're not thinking about a person and what they think about you negatively or positively because you're you. 
I'm whole and complete in Christ, so anything outside of me is not necessary to validate me. I don't have a standard I measure up to. I don't have to dress a certain way to be accepted or rejected by you. As a matter of fact, I'm not even conscious of you anymore. Now, notice how in the world your whole life was centrally focused around how I look and what people think about me and how I'm coming across and who's yelling at me and who's looking at me and how I'm this and how I'm that and all that junk, man, you will go crazy because half of those folks looking at you are crazy, insane, and bums and lesbians. You're out there trying to look good for the lesbians. What's wrong with you? You crazy? Well, you know, I just need somebody to notice me. I'm so empty and hollow inside. See, the search in life, void of God, is looking for something to fill the void that's, that's absent because God is in, isn't in your life. That's what you're looking for. So you got a God-sized hole in your heart, and you're looking for something to fill it. And the devil knows that, so what's he doing? He provides stuff to fill it. And guess what? If the hole in you is eternal, is an eternal vacuum in you, how can you throw temporary physical things into an eternal hole and fill it? Guess what's going to happen? It's going to disappear into the black hole. Because you can't fill eternity up with time and space. So no matter what you do, you don't smoke all the dope. You're smoking dope like a chimney. You got more smoke blowing out of your nose than a chimney does in the, in the winter time. That didn't fill it. You done drunk Hennessy, Chevy's Real, Crown Royale, tequila, brown and white. Everything you can think of. Bourbon, Jim Beam, Johnny Walker Red. I mean, on and on it goes. Patron. And then all the mixed drinks, Long Island iced tea, margarita, give me a martini, give me a 77, give me a rum and coke, give me, and still you can't find it. Cocaine, heroin, sex, drugs, rock and roll, still can't find it because you can't feel it. That's God won't let you be able to feel it. Until you come to him, you can't get right. You can't do it. So outward validation will never satisfy you. How old you are, how young you are, I don't care what you got going on. The world is always going to make it seem like you don't measure up. They want to keep on moving that carrot back. You still don't measure up. You still ain't good enough. And people will learn to exploit that about you unless you let God make you whole. He got to make you whole. Come up for a minute, Ashley. I'll use Ashley as my example. Put your shoes on. Come up here from the country. <laughs> Put your shoes on so we get the full effect of your outfit on camera. Come here to, come here to, uh, to Tanisha. Let this big head hit the seat. <laughs> here's pretty Ashley and here's beautiful Tanisha. Now look at them. They, these are girls that are just themselves hanging loose. They're not going to get and solicit like seduction in the street walking around looking like they look right now because they're just normal people walking around. But they are going to get some guys going to yell at them. It's going to happen. If you send them right now down the street to Taggart, or, or, I mean, uh, uh, what's the name of that place? Target. Taggart's. Ain't that a driving place or something? Taggart's uh, driving school? <laughs> send them down the street to Target to pick up something. It's going to be a couple of bombs in the, in the, in the parking lot. Hey, 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 girl, girl, yeah. they, you're going you to pick it up. What can they do about that? Nothing, but they can control the internal mechanisms in them that respond or don't respond to it. If they don't need that anymore, that whole world is sealed off from them. But when they still got it in them, they messed up. So what's happening? You got the Women out there that come out with everything that's shown, the yoga pants and no underwear and their breasts are hanging out everywhere. And they are now soliciting and exploiting and looking like 
something that's for sale all the time. You always selling, always trying to sell, always selling. And guys don't even want that. You know, lost guys and sinners don't even want you. They'll use you, but they don't want you. But the quality women that walk around without all that going on, they'll see them as somebody I'd like to have, but they'll see themselves as not being able to deal with them because I'm not up to their standard. That's perfect. That's what you want to happen because you're not trying to treat them funny. You respect them, but they don't respect themselves. But somebody got to set a standard where respectability for women has been reestablished so these young girls can look and see there is a standard. But what has happened in society? Everybody's lowered the standard so that Cardi B and Megan the Stallion are the standard. Come on, man. These girls are filthy rich, some of them, like Beyonce, and they go through the red carpet and the runway half naked still. That's the standard for glamour. That's the standard for being a woman. We got to get the standard raised. We've got to get somebody to come back and say, you know what? There is a standard in God. There is a normal in God. We don't tell women to walk around like old hands looking like granny on the Beverly Hillbillies. You know what I'm saying? Girl, you need to uh, take that makeup off. What you doing with that dress on? That dress kind of short. What you doing? Them heels, you need to wear flats, girl. What you think this is? This ain't no brothel. What is wrong with you? But you can look decent, look nice, your little pearls on, and, you know, you look like a nice lady, and people call you ma'am and try to open the door for you. You're normal again. We got to get back to some type of a normal existence for women. I have never seen in my life a generation of women brought down to the level that they've been brought down to. Fatherless, rejected, with a hole in their heart, looking for the world somewhere to identify with me and want me and like me and sign off for me. And guess what? The devil never will. The devil will always reject you. He will always put you down. He will always make you feel like nothing. But when you've been made whole, you can walk around and feel good about yourself from the inside out. Sin undermined that in you. When you went out there and fornicated and tried to be something outside of God, sin was hacking you to pieces. Sin was fragmenting your soul. Sin was making you destitute and making you somebody poverty stricken in the inner man. And you don't want to walk around with that shame, condemnation, and guilt on you. Jesus Christ comes to restore your soul make you whole, and you're going to walk around with some dignity and self-worth and self-respect again. Man, the devil does a dirty work on a woman because you know what? He don't even like women. The devil hates women because women remind him of the Holy Ghost. He don't like women, and he always tries to malign them, degrade them, and castigate them and push them down, down. We don't preach a message that ostracizes women. I'm not a misogynist. I don't debase women. I don't tell women they're low life and they need to submit to a man and get us as a man or else you're going to go to hell. Look, man, look. Be made whole in your own right. Be a human being. Serve the Lord. Do what he says to do and live. You got to learn to breathe again, man, because the devil will suffocate you in the world. He was doing everything he could to malign you and make you into nothing. And we got an age of women beginning to the, the young teen years all the way up to like 35 or 40 that have been destroyed. They've been wiped out. You got Tony Braxton sitting on the internet butt naked, bald headed, having shaved all her hair off after having joined herself to Birdman. You see, we, we, we're in a place that somebody got to step in, male and female, to say, you know what? We got to establish a standard again. Standards got to be reestablished. These women got to put forth a standard. You got to be able to tell these younger girls, look, there is a standard. You don't have to do this. What are you doing all this for, stuff for? Why are you out there with, no, with all this sex just given to anybody? Anybody that wants you can have you. How did you get this devalued in your life? God got to step in through somebody to give an example to this generation. And it's all incumbent upon all of us, men and women, to establish a standard. 
Young guys got to let these young girls know, baby, look, this ain't it right here. I'm going to take you out, but you can't go out wearing that. That ain't, that ain't the standard, baby. But then, no, look, I like you and everything. I think you're a good person, but you need to go and put on some else. Because I don't want to be seen in public with you looking like that. As a matter of fact, you need to burn that. You know, we're going to go shopping for you some new outfits. Because whatever you were before, we need to eradicate that. Because we we're going to a total change. Both of us got saved. We're getting ready to change up the whole script now. We're going to change the whole deal up. I don't want you as a whore like I used to. I got saved for real. You said you got saved for real. It's time for us to make changes. And just go on with God and make the changes. It's no big deal. Thank y'all. Those are good examples, y'all. Y'all give them a hand. Tanisha and Ashley. You know, it's time not to be raggedy anymore. A psychological assault on women through body idolatry. Telling you you never measure up. You're never good enough. Man, don't be around anybody that's always maligning you and putting you down. God edifies. God builds up. God advances. God promotes. God's going to multiply. God's going to add, not subtract. God is always looking to move you up higher and do you better. Make you better. Lift you up, not depress you. We have to go through the negativities of life to get it distracted from you, but it's not. We don't do things to make you call to remember all the stuff you've done wrong. We do things to get rid of what you did wrong so you can live a new life in Christ that's free from all of that. But you can't ignore it. You've got to identify it and then divest yourself of it and then live on. Anybody circling you back to what you came from, man, you better shut your ears to that real fast. I'm talking about for real. Shut down around those folks. Don't let them bring your past up to you. Because the devil always tries to do it to malign you. We don't know what we have yet in the church, y'all, because tares and wheat grew up together. We don't know what the church is yet. Until God separates, we can't really see the bright lights of the church yet. We don't know. We got to just work on ourselves individually until the separation comes. And then we'll get the consolidated amalgamated church as a result. You find in 2 Peter chapter 3, don't turn there, that God's going to dissolve this world. He says, seeing that all these things will be dissolved, he's going to get rid of this world and replace it with another. You got to get rid of these things to prosper in God. First of all, get rid of the curse of the familiar place. You don't need to hang around familiar places forever. You got to go and do something else. Move on. You can get comfortable in a familiar place, and that's undermining your advancement in God. I've been working here for 20 years. You should have moved on 10 years ago. Sometimes the familiar place is preventing you from receiving what God has for you because of the com comfort zone that has become a familiar place to you. God never stands still. He always advances. Don't get comfortable in a familiar place that's going to undermine your advancement in God's, in God's kingdom. We got to deal with the tares sown in the inner court of every individual. Remember, tares are sown into the world as a field, but tares can be sown in your soul as a field. You don't know what the devil sowed in you that hadn't come to fruition yet. We can always pluck up sown seed before it even begins to flourish. So you got to examine yourself to see if those cockatrice eggs have been put in you. The cockatrice eggs are right. Serpent's eggs. The devil will plant something in you at a young age with a plan to bring it to fruition later. But God will come in there and rip it out before it even begins to flourish. He can, he can get stuff out of you even before it attacks you. If you present yourself to God, God will prevent a lot of things that were going to happen to you in your future from even happening. He says, I have a plan for you. He says, I know my thoughts for you. I know I've established a good plan for you. I got a future for you. And I'm going to let the devil know that he's not your master. I'm going to interdict him and stop him and stop his plan for you. But you got to do what? Present your body to God for God to interdict the devil's plans. You got to understand a tear in the church can never completely sell out to God. They won't do it. You'll be pounding your head against a brick wall trying to get a tear to walk in the spirit and walk with God. But a tear can't do it. A tear won't do it. 
a tear stoically sits there and lets God's kingdom pass them by with God having big plans for them from the foundation of their birth when they came into the world. God had big plans for them and the tear is letting God's plan pass them by opting rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin, the Bible says, for a season. You never know what you could be in God while you're in the world. You never know what God was going to do with you and through you and to you. Just caught up in the familiar zones and the, and the limited scope of the devil's plan. I'm locked up on the devil's plan in his world. And now I'm just letting God's plan and the big plan he had for me go. Holding on to $10, I'll forsake $10 million. Isn't that crazy? A bird in the hand ain't worth two in no bush. You know what I'm saying? You've got to explore God's vastness. You've got to let God move you on. You've got to know all the things that God has for you. God is a big God. God don't think in limited thoughts like us. Man, you don't know what you're capable of. You really don't know what he's placed in you until he reveals it to you. You don't, you don't have to be the the 10th or 11th salesperson on your job, you could be the number one salesperson bringing in $200,000 a year because God gave you the wit and the ingenious approach to selling that's going to make you a pharmaceutical salesman high above your peers. And they'll be there in awe trying to figure out how you're doing this. You have the wisdom of God in your mind operating. But if you just settle for just, well, as long as I got something to eat, as long as I, you know, got somewhere to stay. As long as I, no, man. Let God expand your mind. Let God show you bigger things. Let him move your own. While you're down, you might as well maximize your life on the earth while you're in the earth. And let God show you his salvation because he wants to use you and me to save other people. And it takes resources to fuel and finance salvation. Salvation is expensive. If you're just thinking about you, it's not. But if you think about all the world and what they need really to be subject to to be saved, you can't save a girl off a strip joint stage and the girl pulling down $5,000 a week. And you bring her into church and she got two or three kids out of wedlock by three different guys as a stripper, but she really want to be saved. Now, she got to be massaged over into salvation. You can't walk away from $5,000 a week living in a, 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 a house, and she, her, her house note is $4,000 a month because she's making that kind of money. And the $5,000, we were just stripping that on account for the money she made on the side at private parties and guys picking her up at night. So this girl could be pulling in $10,000 a week easy, which translates to $500,000 a year as a stripper. That's real. That's really happening in Atlanta right now. You got girls making a million dollars posing nude on the internet. Okay, she want to get saved for real. She tired. She depressed. She been just burned down by these demonic forces. She tired of being what she is. And she cried out to God. And God sends you her way per adventure with a word from the Lord to set her free. But she got to transition out of that life into a new life. And we got to have resources to sustain her for a minute while she transitions. She need child care. She need job training. She need a new life to be put in place. The church has to mobilize to get these things done, and it costs money. But it's amazing to watch how much money flows to the false, but very little to the real. It's like two different tributaries. If I stand here and tell you about Dunamis Tabernacle, what the plan is, it's a wartime church, a militarized church, going to confront the devil and set his captives free. The money trickles in because the folks say, that ain't nothing for me. But you tell them, this is a prosperity church. Pay your tithes and God's going to bless you a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Prophesying all those lies about a blessing. And they'll just pile the money over there thinking, I'm going to get something out of it. We need the wheat to separate from the tares. And we need the wheat to form up the real church to be a light in the midst of darkness and to be a city on a hill that shines forth with the presence of God. Bundled tares are about to be burned. He's going to separate the false from the real. 
That's a universal global church now. He said the, the field is what? The world. So you're going to separate the tails out of the whole world. And then the wheat are going to come together to do an end time work. Remember, the tares are bundled first to be, bond, to, be, to be burned. That means the bundled tares will come together to be weaponized against us. You see it? When, they, when he bundles those tares, they're going to come together on one accord against the real. That's the end time persecution forming up. But the real are going to shine forth under the persecution to bring in God's people. Because they can finally see the, the global, unified, universal church of God on one accord. And they're going to merge on it because we're going to have the signs and wonders to back us up. And the presence of God will be made manifest. <laughs> why you do that kind of stuff, Makai? You know you're going to get in trouble. Why you do it? Stand up in a chair and then look around like, am I in trouble? Yes. But see, that's what's going on. Once they come together, once we see that church come together, you're going to see those bundled tares preparing to be burned, used by the devil to fight the body of Christ, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees fought the head of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to happen just like I'm telling you. The word is sure. It's going to happen like I'm telling you. All you can monitor is, am I a tear or am I the wheat? Because it's going down. This world needs the church model to you, just like these young girls need women who are actually women with discretion and holiness and sobriety embedded in them. A woman is always a representation of the church. If you got immodest, loose, whorish women, that means the church is in that condition. They model, they're the outward expression of the church, the body of Christ, and a woman's display is always characterized by wholesomeness, holiness, sanctity, discretion, etc., versus harlotry, whoredoms, and just being loose. So if the women would just come to themselves and say, you know what? I'm going to be a handmaid of the Lord and represent the Lord in dignity. I know where I came from. See, your, your litmus test is where you came from versus where you are now. Some things, if you look back at your life, you wonder how in the world was I doing that? See, that, that, that disparity in your own mind is telling you, I, I must have been way out there. Who would even think like that? Why was I even thinking that was normal? What had happened to me? The devil that got into you. And the devil that changed, changed your thinking processes and basically drove you out of your senses. And now God is doing what? Restoring your soul. He's reeling you back in to a normalcy. And you know, you know the most powerful thing about God? The most powerful thing about God is he's able to take you in the state you were in save you, cleanse you, and he's able to expunge his own memory of what you were. He, he can actually blot out your life prior to being saved. And you come to him talking about it, he don't even know what you're talking about. He has actually expunged his own mind and all things have been made new. Now you trying to bring up something that he forgot. He says, I can cast your sins into a sea of forgetfulness. His power is found in the fact that he can forgive sin. He can blot out your transgressions. He can make you whiter than snow. No, though your sins be like scarlet, red as blood, he can make you whiter than snow. That's a lot of power, man. The power to forgive that which he should not be able to forgive. But his power is found in, hey, I'm so powerful, I can forgive anybody of anything. You can't go too far and not be able to make it back with God. He says, my ears are always open to what? The cry of the sinner. If that sinner will cry to me, I will come and I will save them. That's a lot of power. That's the power of God right there, buddy. His righteousness is his power. Then I don't care what you've done. I can overcome it. I can clean you from it. I can restore you. I can make you over again. Man, you've been reset to zero and I can start you all over again. That's a lot of power. Power to forgive. 
Power to heal. Power to cleanse. Power to restore. Power to make you over again. He says you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Don't keep bringing up what you did to God. Don't keep trying to remind God of what you were. He says, I don't see what you were. I see what I'm about to make you. You need to align your mind with my mind, God says, because I got a plan for you from the foundation of the world that you detoured away from. But I'm going to reel you back over here with me and I'm going to set you in right standing, restore your soul and then fulfill your destiny in you for you. Because if you allow me to inhabit you, I'll work this plan in you. Got nothing to do with me and you. He that began a good work in you shall be faithful to complete it. It's a lot of power. It's a lot of power found in forgiveness. It's a lot of power found in being able to wipe your, your slate clean. It's a lot of power found in that God will not impute your sin to you anymore. All he sees is who? Jesus. And if you be found in him, you have become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God in him. You live, you move, you have your being. Man, you got to walk in newness of life. You got to let God come in and take you over and move you across to that promised land. The promised land in our generation is a land of promises. He made promises that he must fulfill. If he's God, he's got to keep his word. Man, how can you forsake such a great salvation? The power is found in his ability to forgive anything. To let you go free. Not imputing any sin to you. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of power. Whereas you hold people captive to their sins and what they did wrong. God let everybody go. If you just come to the Savior. I, pro I even provided the Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I provided even your way out. When you had no way out, I provided you a way out. I found you dead in trespass and sin. He said, I found you wallowing in a pool of blood and I took you in. I washed you. I regenerated you. I restored you. I called you my child. Man, what in the world are we doing? We don't preach a negative message. We preach only positive affirmations for real. That Jesus Christ is all there is. There is no life outside of him. The only hope you have is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if you'll come to him right, he will save anybody. Like the old saying goes, I'm just a nobody. Trying to tell somebody. Anybody about somebody that can save anybody. He can save anybody. Never write somebody off. Never think they've gone too far. Never think they're too dirty. They're unworthy. We got to become a witness. We got to become a regenerated people that can show forth the love and power of God. His power is found in his ability to expunge, to forgive, to restore, to renew, to regenerate, to reestablish, to reaffirm, to rebuild. All those re-words. What you tore up, what you messed up, what you went looking for in the world, God's going to get off of you. Stop wallowing in what you did wrong. Everybody's got an apple out of that bag. All of us are being here crying if everybody stood up and told their story about what they did wrong. But buddy, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Believe. He says without faith, it's impossible to please God. I got to believe that the finished work has already been done. And believe my way in.
I'm not looking for a futuristic now. Why? Because faith is now. Now faith gives substance to the thing I hope for. It's the evidence of the thing I don't see. Buddy, I'm already in heaven. I'm already around the throne. I'm already rejoicing. I'm already through with this world. I'm already a finished product. I'm already established as a child of God. You got to believe this thing. If you would, stand to your feet. Let's pray. Tears. Tares just won't receive their own salvation. Tares fight their own freedom. Tares think that the Son of God is an unholy thing. He's not worth my time. Tares are not thankful. Tares don't realize that salvation was wrought 2,000 years ago on Golgotha's hill, crucified on that mountaintop, and I was set free 2,000 years ago. I just got to receive it. I just got to believe it. I just got to accept it and yield to the Savior. Yield to the Lord and obey him. And I'm in. I'm scot-free. I'm in. I'm in. Obedience is still better than sacrifice. Father God, we thank you that your word is true. All of us came from the realm of sin. All of us came from a realm of perversion. All of us came from a realm where we look for solace and peace and help in a world governed by an evil, wicked one. We thought the devil could supply our needs according to his riches on earth. But you said you supply all of our needs according to your riches in glory. I looked around looking for peace, looking for solace, looking for some kind of help, looking for something to make me feel better, somebody to make me feel better. I look for a relationship with somebody that maybe this can bring me some kind of happiness. Maybe this man or this woman could soothe what's in me. Maybe if I just got with them, I would find peace. I would find some type of happiness and permanence. And I was left empty, high and dry. Can't find it down here, God. Can't find it. I'm ready to move on to higher ground. I want Jesus Christ to take hold of me so completely that everything else fades to insignificance. I want to see this thing come alive in me till nothing else matters. Everything fades to dimness around this. I want to represent you. I want to be a bright, shining light in the midst of darkness. Wherever I walk, hey, look, they're going to know that the Lord has come. The Lord is in me. I was out there in whoredoms, and the light went out in me. The darkness overshadowed me. Man, I didn't even have dignity. I didn't have any kind of value. I had no self-respect for myself. But God, you rebirthed me and reset me to zero and said, look, I called you my daughter. Now, girl, get on out of here and go out there and represent me before the people as a woman of virtue and honor. He told Peter, don't you call this thing unclean that I've sanctified and clean. Let down that sheep from heaven and said, take of this food and eat. He said, I can't eat this unclean food. He said, don't you call that unclean that I have sanctified and cleansed. Man, stop trying to dis disregard and disgrace God by seeing yourself in the wrong light. You dishonor God when you see yourself as nothing. You dishonor God when you tell yourself you have no value. That's disrespectful to God and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Don't let other people put you down and castigate you and bring up your past. That's disrespectful to God and his finished work that he's done in your life. Right now, God, I present all these folk to you. Ask your God to give them a new revelation of who they are in Christ that they can understand the depths and the width and the height of salvation. Man, this is a great salvation. This is something that this far surpasses anything imaginable. I pray, God, that the Holy Ghost come upon them and illuminate them from the inside out. And revelate Jesus to them that they can receive the fullness of this thing. God, right now, in the name of Jesus.
I pray for her for real. I pray for her. I stand with her. That the man that you show her this salvation, you show her exactly who she is for real from the foundation of the world. I don't care where she's gone. I don't care what she's done. I don't care what she's been through. This is a new day. In the name of Jesus. You send your word and you heal people. The devil wanted to use you. The devil wanted to abuse you. The devil wanted to use you up. But God. <laughs> he steps in and said, no, not this one, devil. I'm going to take her for myself. And I'm going to have her with me alone. You are my personal possession. And I'm going to use you as I see fit. And I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk to you. And I'm going to talk through you. In these last days. God, do it. Do it. Make her a specimen of grace. So the world will say. There is a God. I knew her then. I knew her when. But I know her now. That ain't the same person. That's not the same person. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away and all things are made new. Well, the devil meant for bad. Reverse it on that devil and let her save multitudes just by being around. Let her personality be totally reconstructed. Hey, man, I'm a light in the midst of darkness. Whereas I brought darkness, I'm bringing light. I'm bringing light. I'm bringing light to the world. Let that witness change in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. It's time to see some things take off down here. It's time to see a vast improvement in the church. Tears got to move out the way so the wheat can shine forth. It's time to see that light burning brightly in these last and evil days. Bundled to be burned. Tears are being gathered from the church, y'all. It's got to happen. Everything in that Bible is true. It's going to happen just like he said it. And it's happening now. We're in the midst of it happening. Don't look around. Look up. Because your redemption is drawing nigh. Get your soul right. So you can receive everything he has for you. And as you see the church begin. And when you see the church begin to merge together. And you see people begin to come together and solidify. That's the evidence God is about to do something. Don't stand on the outside looking in then. Get in it. And get in it to win it. Father God we thank you for the day. Thank you for the time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that your people are in lockstep with you and everything you've accomplished up to this point is going to pale to almost insignificance compared to what we're about to be. It's time to bring this thing alive, God, and do what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's going to wrap it up for the day, y'all. Remember, the conference coming at us July 29th through August 1st. Register at OmegaMinister.org. Remember, doing the tabernacle support at OmegaMinister.org. Click on support, then donate. Prayer line tonight, 770-712-5603, access code 409367. Stay away from the devil's filthiness, his negativity, everything that's trying to malign you and bring you down. And whatever you do, for God's sake, stay out of the devil's matrix. We'll see you back here next week. Be blessed. Have a good week.